We are live. Welcome to Bob Wren Stadium here in the bottom of the second inning alongside Cedric Granger. I'm Sam Hyman, Cam Appel on the field, field reporter for today's game. 3-1 lead for Youngstown State. The Bobcats threatening with the bases loaded and one out. We apologize for some of the technical difficulties, but glad we are back up and running for this midweek game between Ohio and Youngstown State. The batter is Bryce Smith, and he watches the first pitch dart outside, one ball and no strikes. Big spot here, Cedric, for the Bobcats. It certainly is. They really struggled with runners in scoring position against UIC as well, sustaining offense across innings. You have to make this frame count if you're Ohio. Lane Rhodes searching for that strike zone, has not been able to find it the last four batters. He's walked four in a row. His first start earlier this season, we mentioned it a moment ago, he only faced four batters and walked three of them. 2-0. That clips the top of the strike zone. 2-1. and one. And he has to do that against Bryce Smith, who's coming off of his best game of the season, had a struggling start to the year, but then in his last game against UIC went two for four, so he's really turned it on as of late. Making his fourth start of the season, the graduate student from Virginia Beach. 2-1. And a good job to just sit back and watch that one. Hit the attic, three and one. Yeah, that's interesting. So that pitch, it didn't have enough break downwards that time, uh, which sometimes with any of your pitches that have any sort of break to it, sometimes you get it where it does break a little bit farther down. Sometimes it just doesn't get that break that you want. That one did. There it is, right down the middle, three balls and two strikes. Bryce Smith hitting 154 this season, his fourth start. Year one at Ohio, he played five seasons at Marymount University, a Division three school in Arlington, Virginia. And this is exactly what the doctor ordered for Youngstown State. Wow, a 4-6-3 double play to get Lane Rhodes out of a traffic jam. Ohio gets one run, but that's it. We head to the top of the third inning after this. Youngstown State three, Ohio one from Bob Wren Stadium in Athens, Ohio. A different yeah, schools. 2022 is Pancake. Top of the third inning, here we go. Landon Price throws a nifty 12-6 curveball. That's right down the middle for a called strike to Derek Tarpley Jr. The center fielder struck out looking his first time up. This is the second inning of work for Landon Price, the Ohio State transfer. So far, so good, Cedric. He worked out of a little bit of a jam in the second inning. And here he is for inning number two here in the third. 0-2 pitch on the way to Tarpley Jr. And that misses upstairs. Yeah, so that was the curveball. You saw that on the first pitch strike the second time. Didn't get enough break on that one, but you'll see a fastball around 89, a curveball 70 to 73, and a changeup 75 to 77. Tarpley Jr. rockets this one in the left center field. That's ticketed for the gap. 
Derek Tarpley Jr., the freshman phenom from Brownsville, Pennsylvania, has a double to start the top of the third inning. It is his third double of the season, making his 10th start. And we can't stress enough how dangerous this guy is at the plate. We spoke to Coach Bertolini about him, and Coach said he is electric. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. A friend of mine, Coach said, with uh, Derek's summer ball team, that was the connection. And another friend told Coach Bertolini, you got to see this guy play. And Coach went to see him as the first pitch misses just high to Ian Francis. Coach was told, you know, you got to see this guy play. Derek Tarpley, watch him. Coach went to see him. Couldn't believe no one was in the stands watching him play. And this is a guy who has all the potential, was drafted out of high school as this is laced into left field. Derek Tarpley Jr. rounds third and will stroll into home. Back-to-back -back doubles for the Penguins. This one off the bat of Ian Francis. Going into this game, Sam, one of my keys for Youngstown State was can they find that power surge again from last year? This team hit 123 doubles, a school record in 2023. And can they pick up from where they left off here in this game? And so far, so good in this third inning. Back-to-back -back doubles. Call it double trouble here in Athens. <laughs> they've turned double plays defensively, and they've produced a couple of doubles here in this inning. R.J. Sherwood is at the plate. 0 and one the count. Struck out his first time up. Derek Tarpley Jr. doubled. And Ian Francis is at second base after an RBI double. Landon Price back to work, throws this one downstairs. One ball and one strike. And to your point about Youngstown State and what they did last season, you mentioned setting a, a new single season record for doubles with 123. Here's the 1-1. One, one. And foul tipped into Cassidy's mitt for strike two. Yeah, this is a, Yeah, this is a team that also hit 54 home runs, second most in school history in a season. And they won 12 of their last 15 games after starting 7-33. and 33. As the 1-2 is rolled over towards third, Taylor Gill is up with it. And Bryce Smith can't pick it off the turf. So everybody is safe. Francis remains at second. And R.J. Sherwood is safe at first base. Errors starting to stack up for the Bobcats a little bit. In the Campbell series... They committed six errors. In the UIC series, they committed five errors. Here today, they have now committed three. Yeah, that, that's certainly something that is not going to be a recipe for success as Ohio in yet another jam. Matt Thompson at the plate walked his first time up. Sophomore from Akron, Ohio. Landon Price fires, and here's a beautiful bunt down the third baseline. Price bare hands and has no play. An A-plus bunt, drag bunt, Matt Thompson. He's aboard with an infield single, and the bases are loaded with nobody out. I mean, you, you could not have asked for a better bunt to place it down that third baseline. Nope, not at all. First of all, it not going super far made it a tougher angle for Landon Price to have to track, because when you're in bunt defense, if the third baseman's not in, right. if it's down the third baseline, it's all on the pitcher to be able to sprint to it, and that's a tough angle to have to come down from on the mound. Alejandro Kovas singled his first time up and drove into the freshman. Picked up his first two RBIs of the season in his last A-B. 4-1 lead for Youngstown State in the top of the third. Two balls and no strikes to Alejandro Kovas, the freshman left fielder. One thing to keep an eye on here, uh, Bobcats, their starting pitcher today, uh, Olsen, he's a righty. You switch it up with Landon Price, he's now a lefty. So some of the pitches that Olsen possesses, or check that, uh, Price possesses, will be on the inside part of the hands of some of these batters. So it's a new switch up here relative to last time as that one gets a swing and miss. Uh, by Kova. So you saw some of these guys for Youngstown State get that first opportunity against Olsen, and now they're getting a whole new pitcher essentially right off a coin flip. Usually you have to see the same guy two or three times in a row. Yeah, typically something we do see during midweek games is a lot of different pitchers getting chances to throw. Two balls and two strikes to count to Kovas after he fouled that one off his foot. Yeah. Youngstown. 
OU doing that same thing as well because, you know, this is the last game you got before conference right. game starts. Yeah, Youngstown State still has some other non-conference games coming up. And they, they've got a tough series this weekend down in the ATL. Georgia Tech won't be easy as the one-two misses inside. Two balls and two strikes. But, hey, th this team, this Youngstown State team has the chance, even though they're 0-9, you really can't look at that because of how challenging their schedule has been. Coach Bertolini said, every day is a new day. We've got an opportunity to compete and play baseball each and every day. And he also said in an article on the Youngstown State website, this is without question the deepest team that I have fielded in my eight years here as head coach. And so that, that says a lot. Here's the payoff downstairs. Ball four, and a bases-loaded walk gives Youngstown State a 5-1 lead. Alejandro Kovas heads down to first. Ian Francis scores. R.J. Sherwood moves to third, and Matt Thompson over to second. One thing that frustrates Coach Moore a lot, and when I got to talk with him last week uh, before the weekend series, he mentioned how the free passes – have been the biggest problem for the Bobcats overall as pitching staff. And he feels it's because the pitchers, they've got to raise that aggression level a bit and get rid of that fear of giving up hits. You're going to give up hits. That's going to happen sometimes in baseball. But can you avoid barrels? That's the number one thing that they're looking for. And if you have that timid nature a little bit when you're up there at the mound not attacking that box, it can lead to those walks and missing the zone when instead you should be attacking it. Yeah, that, that is a great point, and we'll see if Landon Price can respond going up against Trey Pancake. Two former Ohio State Buckeyes. They didn't overlap. Trey Pancake was with Ohio State in 2022. Landon Price was with Ohio State in 2023. But, hey, here they are in Athens, Ohio, going up against each other, pitcher and batter. It's the fun thing about the transfer portal sometimes. Guys can start off in the same place and have completely different journeys throughout the college ranks. 2-0 is swung on and missed. Two balls and one strike. Pancake struck out his first time up looking. That was the changeup that time from Price. Good work to kind of throw Pancake's speed off a little bit. 2-1 pitch and a fastball is buried down and in. Three balls and one strike. Pancake, the redshirt sophomore from Negley, Ohio. 188 average coming in. This is his fifth start of the season. 3-1 is bounced foul. Full count. Last season, Trey Pancake played in one game, just one, as a position player. Made three relief appearances and then suffered a season-ending injury. So good to have him back. A guy that has a ton of speed out of South Range High School, a D3 All-Ohio first-team selection. Payoff pitch is upstairs, and... Landon Price is trying to discover the strike zone. Again, he's walked back-to-back -back batters, and now Youngstown State increases its lead to 6-1 here in the top of the third. Yeah, and here comes Coach Tim Brown. I suspect he'll have some words to say for his pitcher as nobody right now currently is throwing in the bullpen, but there are some guys getting loose over there, so this is... In a situation where it is up to Price to figure out his way out of this. And I think this is a big moment in a young pitcher's career. Is Oh, actually they are. Yeah, yeah I didn't even see a guy throwing it we, in there. We, My bad. <laughs> I, I, didn't see, I didn't see one either. I think he was already ready to go. Probably. Yeah, Tim Brown taking the ball from Landon Price. Six to one. Youngstown State leads Ohio here in the top of the third inning. The Horizon League against the Mid-American Conference. We're going to take a quick break. And come back, Bobcats with work to do to end the top of the third. Come back and join us from Athens.
Pitching change here in the top of the third inning with nobody out. Tough situation to come in for any pitcher. And the person that's going to have to make something happen is Carson Denham, the 6'2 graduate student from Cape May Courthouse, New Jersey. His first appearance as a Bobcat this season had been dealing with some arm issues during the preseason. Coach Moore happy to have him back, and he fires a first pitch. Swung on and missed for strike one to Teddy Ruffner, the designated hitter. Bases are loaded with nobody out. Youngstown State leads 6-1. to one. Denham again. Strike, 0-2, oh good start. Yeah, some good horizontal movement on those early pitches here from Denham, where he played at Arcadia for his last school, which is interesting. They played in a MAC themselves, just the Mid-Atlantic Conference instead of the Mid-American. 0-2 oh, is punched on a line in the shallow right field that drops in front of A.J. Roush. One run scores. The throw is bounced towards Taylor Gill at third. RBI single, Teddy Ruffner. And Youngstown State increases its lead to 7-1 here in the top of the third inning. Yeah, Ruffner's starting to really come on as of late, too. Uh, he's been a guy that's been really the home run threat for Youngstown State this year as three out of his, uh, or check that, two out of his five hits this season have been home runs, the only home runs for YSU, but now starting to work gap to gap, which a lot of players like to build that into their game as well. Brett Stanley, the second baseman, takes a ball 1-0. So, yeah, Teddy is starting to get adjusted this season after transferring over from UNC Wilmington. He only played nine games across two seasons. This is his first season at Youngstown State, so productive work for Teddy at the bottom of the order as Stanley is looking at a two ball, no strike count with nobody out still in the top of the third inning. Carson Denham with a ton of work to do and he hits Stanley on the shoulder. So that'll bring in another run, Alejandro Kovas. Trey Pancake moves to third, Teddy Ruffner over to second, and Stanley heads to first. And this is, a, this is getting to be a little bit <laughs> challenging now if you're Ohio with this midweek game, potentially having to utilize a, a, a bunch of different pitchers. Denham trying to respond, though. Yeah, and they already used a lot of relief arms that they feel really good about this past Sunday. They did a great job the Friday game, only using two pitchers. Saturday game, two pitchers. Sunday, they had to utilize four pitchers in that game. And now in this situation, you don't want to utilize too many arms. There's significant rest before Friday, uh, and chances are either Friday or Saturday due to the rain uh, that's projected in the forecast. There'll be a doubleheader, so maybe an extra day of rest in there. But it would be taxing. And Youngstown State continues to make noise. One run is in off that bloop single, and here comes a second, Teddy Ruffner. Pancake scored before him, and it is all Youngstown State. The Penguins feels like a blizzard here in Athens right now. 10 to one, we're in the South Pole. And the Bobcats didn't bring their winter jacket in this situation, Sam, and you know, gotta give credit to Youngstown State. I'm sure when they looked at the schedule, they looked at the opportunity here you're sitting at 0-9 on the season. Where do you think your first win can happen? And you're like, hey, I think this is a good opportunity here. Yeah. Especially you compare this to you know, Louisville or Georgia Tech, which have been the games that are sandwiched around this Bobcat matchup. And they've come in with an attitude. They've come in with that desire to go and give, be aggressive at the plate, and it's really paid off. I mean, eight hits today. That's emphatic. 0-1 oh to Derek Tarpley Jr., and he scorches that one foul. It's 69 degrees in Athens, Ohio right now, but Youngstown State, the Penguins, are they're making it feel like Arctic temperatures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know in Ohio, it's never really spring until you know it's May. <laughs> it, there, I feel like there's a week week's worth of potential. This is crushed. High in the air and deep to center field, Derek Tarpley Jr. My goodness, an absolute no doubter. Goodbye baseball. Derek Tarpley Jr. with his first home run of the season, and it will not be forgotten. I mentioned it earlier in the inning, Sam. Power surge. Can Youngstown State bring the power that they had last year to this year's team? Some of the players have carried over from that squad. One of the new guys, though, 
into this lineup is Derek Tarpley. And in BP, we saw, we were already impressed with what we saw from him yes. just in terms of the swings. He's actually wearing a different jersey number for the BPs, but we knew it was him just based off of the way that he was swinging the bat. And you got to see it right there as soon as it came off of that barrel. You knew that one was gone. Yeah, Derek, we, were, we were watching Derek Tarpley Jr. during BP, and we cannot emphasize enough how incredible his swing is as this is a swung on and miss for a strike. Ian Francis, who doubled in this inning, 13-1 to one is the score. That was a three-run blast for Derek Tarpley Jr., his first home run of the season. He also has a double in this inning as well. 0-2 the count to Ian Francis. And again, Derek Tarpley Jr., if you don't know the name, you're not familiar, he's only a freshman from Brownsville, Pennsylvania, under the radar coming out of high school, but but not under the radar. He was also drafted out of high school, but ends up at Youngstown State early on in his high school career. Not a lot of people went to, to go see him. And we'll bring this up because if you're joining us a little bit later on in the broadcast, Derek Tarpley Jr., according to Coach Bertolini, no one was really out there at his games, whether it was summer ball or high school, scouting him. One, two, and that is a skyscraper into shallow right field. A.J. Roush maneuvers in. Alex Finney backpedals, and it's Finney who catches it. And finally, finally after we witness Youngstown State bat around without a single out, we have the first out of the inning, Cedric. Yeah, you know, you got to give credit to Youngstown State where credit is due. I'm sure it was frustrating some of the games that they had against Louisville. Aside from their two-out rally in the ninth inning, they were not able to sustain any offense. One run scored in game one, two runs scored in game two, and then, like I said, they lost nine to five, or uh, two runs scored in game three, rather. And then the second game against Louisville, they had a two-out rally where they scored five runs late in the game to avoid a shutout. So to come here on the road, you go against a different pitching staff, and you have a guy out there on the mound you may feel good about, and as a hitter, it's a great chance to build confidence. And they have really reined in the hits as the rain starts to fall here in Athens. Yeah, light drizzle right now as R.J. Sherwood is at the plate. One ball and two strikes. But my goodness, 13 runs on nine hits, no errors for Youngstown State, and we are just in the third inning here in Athens, Carson Denham fires, and this is fouled third base side. One ball and two strikes. Talking about this Youngstown State offense, as we mentioned earlier, 54 home runs last year, second most in a season in, in program history, 123 doubles, a, a single season record last year. But they did lose quite a bit of their electricity in the lineup as the one-two misses outside, two balls and two strikes, three of their top home run hitters, Andre Good, Padraig O'Shaughnessy, and Braden O'Shaughnessy all depart from the program. But you bring in a guy like Derek Tarpley Jr., who's that tone setter at the two spot as the 2-2 misses outside. Three balls and two strikes to R.J. Sherwood, the right fielder. Yeah, you bring in also guys like Alejandro Kovas and then guys like Teddy Ruffner also stepping up to bring in that slugging. Three balls and two strikes. Denham delivers. And this is, once again, a towering pop-up on the infield this time. Great communication. Bryce Smith yells, ball, ball. And he certainly is able to make the catch for out number two. That's exactly what you want from a first baseman to communicate like that and really be vocal in that situation. Well, when we talked to Coach Moore, Sam, one thing that he said was, how do you build momentum? And we asked, yeah, how do you do it? And he said, by communication. If you have yeah. communication that's great defensively, that's a way that you can generate your own momentum. And the Cats, they need any momentum they can get. Down 13-1 to one here in the top of the third inning. And this pitch is lifted high in the air down the right field line. A.J. Roush sprints over towards the corner, and it lands in the Youngstown State bullpen. Yeah, if you're Lane Rhodes, speaking of bullpen pitching, Lane Rhodes, is, he's been sitting for quite some time, the starter for Youngstown State. You wonder if that will have any impact or if he's even going to come out for a third inning of work. Certainly a question. He did have a good number of walks, but talk about run support coming in with a 12-run lead. 
you got to feel good about yourself. And from a coaching standpoint, it just would make sense. You want your starter to go as long as you can. This is a great chance also to build some confidence, too. If he hasn't played as well throughout the beginning of the season, you put him in when you're leading by 12 runs, that's a great chance to have yeah. a three, four, at least a five-inning start. One ball and two strikes. That misses outside. Two balls and two strikes. 12 at-bats in this inning alone for Youngstown State as the rain continues to fall at a bit more of a moderate pace right now. Two and two becomes three and two. Yeah, that wasn't in the forecast as far as I know. Now, you, you've lived in Athens, Ohio longer than I have. What, what is happening? <laughs> well, March is happening. That's what, you know, this time of season we first called our first game. It was snowing and there's a blizzard. So, you know, you take this. And Carson Denham will take that. 3-2 pitch is swung on a miss for strike three. So finally, 12 at-bats from Youngstown State in the third inning. They put up a, a plethora of runs here in the top of the third. The score is 13-1. to one. Ten runs come across. And yep. Youngstown State leads it 13-1, to one, heading into the bottom of the third inning right after this from Athens, Ohio. We'll be back. Youngstown State just put up a 10 spot in the top of the third inning. The Penguins lead the Bobcats 13 to one as we head into the bottom of the third inning. Back with Cedric Granger, I'm Sam Hyman, and Cam Appel is our field reporter who hopefully has an umbrella because the rain is starting to fall and fall at more of a moderate pace right now. Ohio sends the top of the order, Cole Williams, J.R. Nelson, Gideon Antle to kickstart the bottom of the third. New pitcher for Youngstown State. And it is the side armor, Niall Todd, the freshman out of Marietta, Georgia, makes his fifth appearance of the season. One ball and no strikes to Cole Williams. Next pitch, maneuvers inside, two balls and no strikes. Niall Todd last appeared over the weekend against Louisville. Two-thirds of an inning gave up two, uh, pardon me, three earned runs and walked three batters. 2-0 pitch, misses outside, three balls and no strikes to Cole Williams, the left fielder from Charlotte, North Carolina. Yeah, I like the choice here to go to some of the younger guys in your staff as well to get some good reps if you are Coach Bertolini. Well, Ohio draws a leadoff walk in the bottom of the third inning. We certainly know in midweek college baseball, no lead is safe. We know the score is 13 to one, Youngstown State in front. Remember, this is a Youngstown State team that has not won a game this season. They're 0-9, and, 
And Ohio has the ability to flip the switch and turn on the offense, and now is a good time to do that with J.R. Nelson, the two-hitter, and then Gideon Antle, who's got the second-best batting average in the MAC coming into today on deck. The 0-1, and J.R. Nelson takes outside. One ball and no strikes. The freshman from Vernon Hills, Illinois, One one pitch is a nice slider that fools J.R. Nelson. One ball and two strikes. Yeah, especially when you see sidearm throwers, it's a lot di more difficult for batters when you're up in the in the box to see what type of pitch is coming your way. That's something that I've seen consistently people talk about whenever you're dealing with guys that are sidearm or submarine. Check swing and Nelson went around, got jammed up there, so strike three. J.R. Nelson is a bit confused. Our umpiring crew, we forgot to mention, Jimmy Craig behind home plate, Mark Lalo at first, and Bryce McCullough is the second base umpire. It is a strikeout, so Nelson is retired. And here comes Gideon Antle. He has one of those entertaining vocal personalities, if you will, on this Ohio roster. Smashes this one down the right field line. That's drifting foul near Youngstown State's bullpen. And the count is nothing and one. I remember being at one of Ohio's practices last season, Cedric, and I was thinking about miking somebody up, and, and everybody pointed to Gideon Antle. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, when it comes to big personalities, there's a couple here on the Bobcats, but Antle's, his shine's are pretty bright. 0-1, a soft dribbler towards short. Trey Law, no turn. Throws to first, and that is picked in and out of Trey Pancake's mitt. Everybody's safe. Maybe some moisture there on that baseball with the rain starting to come down. Impacted the throw from Trey Law. Ohio has runners at first and second with one out in the bottom of the third, down 13 to one. Well, Sam, when I was in the Northwoods League, there was one team that did have turf, at least in the Great Lakes Division. That was the Kokomo Jackrabbits. And I got to talk to some of the players on the Battle Jacks about what it was like playing on turf versus playing on grass. They say the turf, the ball moves almost like a hockey puck on ice. It's that big of a difference, and it can lead to some ridiculously high-scoring games. I mean, this one already had 14 total runs, but this one could get a little bit more dicey as we go yeah, on. <laughs> no doubt, and I think that you bring up a great point as A.J. Roush steps in. With the turf, the moisture, it does make it the ball skip a lot more as opposed to if it was grass, that would slow the ball down significantly so it is it is an adjustment now the outfield here is grass but the infield is turf first and second one out bottom three the 2-0 and A.J. Roush takes on the inside corner for a called strike two and one to Roush who is a redshirt junior from Powell Ohio out of Olentangy Liberty High School coached by Ty Brenning that misses outside, three and one. Yeah, one of four Olentangy schools. So that's something where, you know, you have a lot of rivalries in there. Columbus, of course, with the high population. You got some fantastic baseball being played, and many Bobcats from New Albany, Gahanna's, Olentangy's, Westerville's. You see it all over the roster. Full count after that foul ball from A.J. Roush. We had a great report from Cam Appel, our field reporter earlier, who talked about A.J.'s growth into high school where – he had to wait his turn and wasn't ready for varsity early on in his high school career at Olentangy Liberty. Worked his way up, won a state championship as a sophomore and sat the bench mostly that season. 3-2 is just inside. That is a discipline at bat from Mr. A.J. Roush. Bases are loaded with one out, and here comes Trey Cassidy, the catcher. It used to say in that a lot here today with just both teams really struggling with walking batters throughout this season, especially the Bobcats as of lately, and then YSU throughout the entire season. Uh, expect to continue seeing walks. That's now the sixth walk of yep. the day for the YSU pitching staff. Cassidy takes an off speed on the inside corner for a strike. Nothing and one. Trey Cassidy walked. You, you could have guessed that maybe with uh, <laughs> the trend that we're seeing. Walked his first time up. As the freshman watches this one settle in a bit too tight. 
One ball and one strike. Bases are loaded for Ohio. Cole Williams at third, Gideon Antle at second, A.J. Roush at first. One ball and two strikes. Now a good opportunity for the Bobcats to have their lefties in their lineup shine a little bit more too. Um, now going against a lefty pitcher too. I know when you have a right-handed pitcher, you do want your lefty bats up there too. But it's important also for lefty batters to hit well against other lefties. Rain appears to have slowed down and maybe has stopped completely, it looks like, from, from my eyesight. 2-2. Two -two. And that misses just low, three balls and two strikes. Now, don't speak too soon, <laughs> Sam. You know, first it might be rain, then the rainbow comes in, oh, and then yeah. the snowstorm comes in. Who knows? I think we saw the snowstorm already in the third. <laughs> yeah, we, we, were in the, the third. we were in the South Pole in the top of the third <laughs> inning. So another walk. Ohio has now drawn seven walks in this game. And this time the bases were loaded, so Cole Williams scores. Bases remain loaded. Gideon Antle moves to third. A.J. Roush at second. And Trey Cassidy at first. Alex Finney, the second baseman for the Bobcats at the plate. And the first pitch is just a bit low. One ball and no strikes to the fifth-year senior from Oxford, Michigan, looking for his first home run of the season. That would come at a good time if it happened right now with the bases loaded. 1-0 is off speed and low. Two balls and no strikes. Yeah, and I think you led off this inning with a great point about how no lead is safe, especially in these rainy conditions. There's still a long way to go with this game, and if the Bobcats keep their head in it, there is opportunity potentially to get back in this matchup. Uh, now with the change in pitcher, you went from having a guy that sinker gave the Bobcats a lot of issues in terms of hitting into double plays. You now have a, a different pitcher up there at the mound where you might be able to avoid some of those ground balls a little bit more. Uh, and then, in other words, also, this is the Bobcats team. If you look at last year, they have come back from big deficits. You yeah. Think about that Miami game. They were trailing by seven in the eighth inning and came back to win that one. 3-1 pitch is outside. Ball four. Eight walks for Ohio hitters in this game. And they just keep on coming. And the Bobcats now will send Taylor Gill to the plate. The base is still loaded. 13 to 3, and I did lie. The, the rain has not stopped. <laughs> I told you, don't speak too I, soon. Don't I speak did, too soon. I definitely, definitely spoke too soon. But it, it, it looks like a comfortable rain. Yeah. Maybe we'll hear from our field reporter, Cam <laughs> Appel, about whether or not the rain is actually comfortable or yeah, not. Yeah, literally, whether or not. <laughs> a little misting that's going on there. Um, Shane Davis, by the way, making his uh, second trip to the mound in this game, sixth season as the pitching coach for Youngstown State. He's not the only player, or pardon me, he's not the only coach on staff with Youngstown State that knows a ton about pitching. Assistant coach Trevor Sharpie in his first season most recently served as a pitching coach at Golden West College last season. He had an unbelievable college career, navigated through three schools, Tennessee, Saddleback College, and then Nevada where he wrapped up a, a heck of a career and spent the 2016 summer with a really, really good St. Cloud Rocks team in the Northwoods League Summer Collegiate Baseball. Always a great opportunity to get reps in as Taylor Gill takes a strike on the outside corner, and I must say Trevor is sharp. He, 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 he knows his stuff, and I'm sure he and Shane Davis definitely work tirelessly with these Youngstown State pitchers who need to find a way to get out of this jam because the bases are loaded with only one out. Yeah, it's been tricky, Sam, for YSU throughout this whole season as the Penguins, they have yielded around nine walks per game this season, just a little bit under that at 8.8 .8 walks per game. And right now they're already at eight through three innings. Taylor Gill walked his first time up, the junior from Orem, Utah. And he swings through and misses for strike three. So some off-speed junk there from Niall Todd. And that is out number two. Yeah, I like the pitch selection there that time. And a really good bounce back from Todd. And if you're the coaching staff for Youngstown State, you've got to feel great. Right after having that meeting with a very young pitcher, took the coaching points to heart, settled himself in, and got a K. 
First pitch strike here to Clay Cutter, the designated hitter, senior from Centennial, Colorado. Walked his first time up. Big spot here in this game, 13-3 Youngstown State, but the bases are loaded with two outs. One ball and one strike. By the way, pitching coach Shane Davis for Youngstown State, teammates in high school back in the day with head coach Dan Bertolini. So that, that's pretty cool how deep those two go back. This 1-1 one, one hits Clay Cutter on the ankles. So that'll bring in another run. A.J. Roush scores, and Ohio is within nine, 13 to four with two outs, and the base is still loaded. Yeah, I think it's time to start going through the score books and history books right now to see what's the most combined runs in a game because right now, <laughs> 17 and three, you're on quite the pace. This could help it too. Bryce Smith hammers this one out to deep right center field. It's carrying and it's off the wall. Sherwood can't get there. One run is in. Here comes another. And Alex Finney will touch home. A base is clearing triple. How about it for Bryce Smith? And Ohio is within six here in the third inning. It's 13 to seven. A two out, three run triple for Bryce Smith. Pretty much right on cue there. I told you about, I was about to say the pace is right now at about 51 runs, and now it's up to 60 runs if you take the first three and put that over the next couple of innings if it continues at this pace with the Bobcats. It might not be done yet here in this ninth, or third. My goodness. Trey Cassidy, Alex Finney, and Clay Cutter all come across. And it's now 2-0 the count to Cole Williams, who led off the inning. So this third inning, my goodness, we should have had a stopwatch. <laughs> it's had to have been at least 30 minutes. Yeah, and this is batter 23, I believe, of the entire frame. And we're sitting at inning number three, bottom of the third. And it is 524. We started at 4 o'clock. So it's a long way as it appears that Todd is injured. Yeah, Niall Todd is going to get looked at by Youngstown State's athletic trainer and Dan Bertolini, the eighth-year head coach, and it looks like we're going to have a pitching change. So we are going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll hear from our field reporter, Cam Appel. So stick around for that. It is a brand-new ball game, 13-7, after a three-run triple for Bryce Smith. And there's still work to be done. Two outs in the bottom of the third. We'll step aside from Athens.
Three balls and no strikes. We had a pitching change due to an injury, and that is ball four. New pitcher is Nolan Kabilis. Cam Appel, our field reporter, is back with us. Cam, what do you have for us? Thanks, Sam. YSU's head coach, Bertolini, was in the dugout telling his team to keep the energy on their side. That energy was on display when Youngstown's Derek Tarbley Jr. recently hit a home run. He's better known on the nickname I've heard down on the field today, which is Tarp. <laughs> Tarbley was a Brownsville area standout player who was even drafted by the Oakland Athletics in this past year's MLB draft. He decided to take his talents to Youngstown where he's made an immediate impact since recently being named the preseason Horizon League Freshman of the Year. It has been quite the journey already, Cam, as you outlined there for Derek Tarpley Jr. to high school and then drafted out of high school only the second player since 1975 from that school drafted out of high school. J.R. Nelson will line that one into shallow left field. Ohio with two outs, not done yet in the third. It's a seven-run inning after that RBI single from the freshman J.R. Nelson. And Ohio, after trailing 13-3, Cedric, boom, it's 13-8. Yeah, it's a good piece of hitting consistently by the Bobcats. And one thing I want to highlight, actually make it two. Two out hitting situations and also hitting with runners in scoring position. The Bobcats came into their series against UIC batting 295 with runners in scoring position, yet they struggled throughout the Flames series doing that. So I wanted to see how they would hit when runners are at second base, runners are at third base. And they responded in this third inning with a bases clearing triple by Bryce Smith as well as that nice RBI single by J.R. Nelson. 1-0 is upstairs. 2-0 to Gideon Antle. Crazy to think that Ohio has eight runs on only three hits. It's got to be just wild to even comprehend. Yeah, that's what walks do to you. Two out walks and also walks when nobody's out. Those are the two worst times <laughs> to have walks in those situations. And it can come back to bite you. And right now it has come back to bite YSU. They still do, though, have a great pad to their lead right now. 2-1 pitch, Antle crushes this one high in the air, deep to center field, goodbye! Gideon Antle with a three-run blast. A 10-run bottom of the third. Anything you can do, I can do as well. 10 runs from Youngstown State in the top of the third. How about 10 from Ohio in the bottom of the third? It's a two-run game. It is a bonanza. You know, anybody that is at home, if you like a good old-fashioned pitcher's duel, this is not your game. <laughs> not your game at all. 13-11 to 11 is Gideon Antle, once again, comes up with big home runs. He had the game winner in game two against UIC. And right now, he ranks 16th in all of NCAA. Not just in the match. Yeah. No, in all of the NCAA Collegiate Division I landscape, he is 16th in batting average, and he's just going to continue to go up. I mean, these in this top half and now bottom half of the th they're literally mirror images of each other right now. Ten runs. I've never seen this before. I'm only 29 years old, <laughs> but I, I've never seen a team score ten runs in the top half of an inning, and then the team – that bats in the bottom half of the inning, scored 10 runs. Yeah, Never seen it. You might see that like in a football quarter, but yeah, no. In baseball, very, very rare. I, I don't <laughs> know how many times that has happened. I mean, right now, these two teams, they're doing a good job. They're outscoring any Iowa football game that I've ever seen <laughs> in this inning alone. How about that? Yeah, Iowa, Iowa State, that's normally like a 9-6 final. That's right. <laughs> A.J. Rouse draws a walk with two outs. Right now, pitchers on neither side could just find ways to throw strikes. If we had the breakdown right now from um, of strikes, or pitches thrown for strikes versus pitches thrown for balls or pitches thrown for out of the zone, I feel like it would be a really bad ratio right now. <laughs> yeah, it, it's in this inning, six walks in this inning for Youngstown State pitching. And this is hammered into shallow right field, a base hit. Trey Cassidy continues this bottom of the third inning. That's his first 
hit of this game and his f just his second hit of the season making his first career start. Yeah, great work there by Cassidy, first of all. And good job by Roush, too, base running. He got on his high horse. It's a two-out situation, so you know you got to run anyway, even if the ball is caught or not. So he sprinted to second. He was able to turn that into just moving up one. He's able to move up two as a result with a headfirst dive as well into that third base bag. So getting a little style points, too, in my opinion. So the Bobcats could perhaps one-up the Penguins after their 10-run top of the third. Ohio currently has a 10-run bottom of the third but there's a runner on third base so if Ohio gets a hit and and you know Ohio one ups Youngstown State and does the unthinkable 0 and 2 the count now to Alex Finney who walked twice in his first two ABs Nolan Kabilis delivers that one and it's popped up on the infield first base side Trey Pancake makes the grab and finally the inning comes to an end. We don't have the official time, but it was certainly an inning that lasted more than 30 minutes. 10 runs from Youngstown State in the top of the third. Ohio responds with 10 runs in the bottom of the third. Stuff you don't see every day. 13-11 is our score. We go to the fourth inning next from Athens, Ohio in Bob Wren Stadium. All right, folks, we are back. 13-11 is our score heading into the top of the fourth inning with Cedric Ranger and Cam Appel. I'm Sam Hyman, something that I've certainly never seen before. Cedric, I think you can attest to it as well. Ten runs in the top of the third and then ten more runs in the bottom of the third. Our score is 13-11, Youngstown State. New pitcher on the mound, Southpaw Adam Beery, the junior from Ohio out of Rootstown High School, faces off. Youngs against this Youngstown State lineup. And the 1-0 misses, oh, pardon me, hits the outside corner for a strike, 1-1. One one. Cedric, you're pretty familiar with Mr. Adam Beery. Yeah, I sure am. He played for the Southern Ohio Copper Reds two years ago when I was the broadcaster for the team. And I really love what he's got in terms of pitch selection here. That one is fouled off towards uh, OSF. But in terms of his pitches, he's got a fastball around 84, curveball 72 to 75, changeup 72 to 76. And then hear this, the slider around 60 miles per hour. So there's a significant disparity in the speed of some of his pitches, and that can throw batters off sometimes. 1-2 is golfed into shallow left field. Cole Williams lets it drop. That is a leadoff single for Youngstown State here in the top of the fourth inning. 
And that'll bring up Trey Pancake. So Alejandro Kovas with his second hit of the game. Trey Pancake 0 for 1, a walk and a run scored. Beery making his second appearance of the season through two innings against Campbell and did not allow a run. Walked two batters and struck out two. Ohio's had a challenging schedule too. We did outline that Youngstown State played against Louisville, an ACC opponent, College of Charleston, a tough team, as well as Texas State as Pancake bunts low, pulls the bat back, and Cassidy's throw skips into shallow center field. So Alejandro Kovas making things a bit troublesome for Ohio on the base paths. He's at third base after attempting a steal over at first. Yeah, I think that's a really smart steal attempt there by Kovas. Think of the situation. you got a freshman behind the dish making his first start today. You pair that with the rainy conditions and the baseball being very slick. Uh, it makes it very difficult to be caught stealing. So why not take your chances, especially since there's already been multiple errors. That's the fourth one of the day on the Bobcats. And the second on the catcher, Trey Cassidy. Pancake takes high, three balls and no strikes. So yeah, Ohio opened the season against Lipscomb, defending A-Sun champs. Actually won the first two games in that series as that's a strike three and one. So took the first two games, started the season 2-0 and uh, and beat Lipscomb twice and then had to go down to North Carolina and take on Campbell, who is a perennial power in the Big South. Good bounce back here for Adam Beery, full count. And got swept by Campbell, Ohio, after starting the season 2-0. and They've dropped five of their last six and currently sit 3-6 and six overall. This is a one-hopper to short. J.R. Nelson deep in the hole, fires to first in time. Youngstown State will take some insurance early. That's an RBI ground out for Trey Pancake. And it is now Teddy Ruffner's turn out of the eight spot. Now the Bobcats are challenges to break out of the slump, so to speak. They have lost six out of their last seven, but it hasn't been against easy competition. You take a look at Campbell. By some metrics, they are ranked in the top 25 now, Sam. Yeah, Campbell's one of those really good teams. Zach Neto, who used to play at Campbell and ended up getting drafted a couple of years ago. He was a, a very talented shortstop. I remember watching him when I lived in North Carolina, and, and he played against a, a really good Gardner-Webb team. Campbell is very well known for quality baseball. Their pitching coach won a D2 National Championship as a coach a couple of years ago. As the 0-2 is swung on and missed for strike three, Adam Beery records the strikeout, and there are two down for Brett Stanley out of the nine spot. Yep. So yes, it is. A, it's been a tough schedule for Ohio, and you know Craig Moore was excited about his guys having the opportunity to play that that type of competition heading into MAC play, which, by the way, folks, starts this weekend against Northern Illinois. Yeah, it is right around the corner for the Bobcats. So this is like here. You get a chance to get right in this game, and you're not going to see a lot more non-conference opponents for the Bobcats, at least in terms of weekend series. Uh, but they will continue to play teams in the midweek out of conference. You think of Dayton, who had that yeah. upset win over Vanderbilt earlier this season. Vanderbilt, number top 10 team in the country. Uh, so it really showcased how good that Dayton team is going to be. Moorhead State has been a good home-and-home -home opponent for the Bobcats that they have recently or consistently played recently. And then you continue that on with a team like Marshall, a rival of the Bobcats that they have matched up against year in and year out. Should be a great schedule. Also, yeah. Virginia Tech I was later say, in the season. Virginia in Tech. Series. Yeah, Virginia Tech's actually the only series left that is a non-conference series over a weekend. But that is not until the weekend of May 4th and 5th. So a two-game set in Blacksburg against the Hokies. So that, that'll be very interesting. There goes the runner, and Trey Law bounces it foul, first base side. Brett Stanley just reached a moment ago for Youngstown State. And if you missed it, you could probably guess what happened. Brett Stanley walked. 
Well, funny enough for Bobcats, it's only their fifth walk as um, to Denham's credit, despite giving up four runs, uh, he did not walk a single batter. Yeah, that is true. As the rain starts to pick up a little bit here at Bob Wren Stadium, we did not expect to see a lot of rain today. I no, got to be honest. It was supposed to be a picture perfect day where we were like, oh, get all the kids out with their um, backpacks coming from their college classes to get out here, have a good crowd. And, you know, sometimes things don't turn out exactly how you thought. I think both of these coaches in <laughs> either dugout didn't expect a 14 to 11 game in the fourth, but here we are. And you got to make do with what you got. Got to check your local Doppler radar. It can update within seconds as this is fouled back. One ball and two strikes to Trey Law, the shortstop from Camp Hill, Pennsylvania. Highlighted him at the top. Coming into this game, 10 hits to lead the team. Last year, a second team All-Horizon League selection. Coach said he's a scrappy player. Look at this. Beery has the runner picked off. And the throw from Smith over to second is in time. Adam Beery, watch out. The southpaw, surprise, surprise, picks off Brett Stanley to end the inning. And now we go to the bottom of the fourth. Just one run. Only one run that comes across in the top of the fourth inning. We go to the bottom half of the fourth. When we come back, Ohio is down 14-11 to 11 here in Athens, Ohio. Back here in Athens, Ohio, a steady rainfall, an unexpected steady rainfall transpiring before our very eyes. Welcome back inside the broadcast booth alongside Cedric Range. I'm Sam Hyman and Taylor Gill, ladies and gentlemen, opening up the bottom of the fourth inning with a bang. He doubles into left center field to lead off the bottom of the fourth inning. Taylor Gill's first hit of the game. And his first season with the Bobcats after transferring over from Northeast Community College in Nebraska. So how about this, Sam? In the last eight plate appearances for the Bobcats, they have a collective cycle. One triple, one home run, one single, and now they got their double. It has been an offensive explosion for both teams. And if you're just joining us, scores 14-11. to 11. Youngstown State has led the entire way, but Ohio after giving up 10 runs in the top of the third, responded with 10 runs of their own in the bottom of the third to get this game a lot more interesting. Here's Clay Cutter, squares to bunt, pulls the bat back. 
One ball and no strikes. It's an Ohio team that last year went 19 and 30 and 15 and 15 in the MAC. Felt like they got snubbed a little bit. No all conference selections at all from a pitching or position player standpoint. Didn't make the MAC tournament and out to prove something. And that may have just slipped with the wet rain that's falling down. Gill advances to third easily, but. Yeah, thought, thought that they may have been able to have one or two players on an all-conference team last year. Cedric did not and did not make the tournament. Jacob Tate said, you know, it left a sour taste in our mouth. But Coach Moore told me before the season, we are motivated to show that we can play this game at a high level. Yeah, and you're right about that. And I think one other factor that has led to that was just the way they ended the season. We talked about Youngstown State ended the season strong. Well, the Bobcats on the other side of the matchup, they lost 10 out of their last 12. They were firmly in that top yeah. four. They were actually near the top three, closer to, hey, are they going to compete with Kent State and Ball State for the top two seeds as well as Central Michigan for those spots? And then here comes the Western Michigan Broncos. They sneak up on them. Um, they win that series against the Bobcats up in Kalamazoo and then ultimately take the last spot. And I know for the Bobcats, to end the season like that, especially after the momentum they had after the Miami series, yeah. there's a lot of frustration that's there. And I think the Bobcats, too, they struggled late in the year because how backloaded the schedule was. You think about it, Sam, they had to take on Ball State and Kent State and Western Michigan late in the season. That's three out of the four teams that made up the MAC tournament. And this year, it's a little bit more spread out. You actually have in your first three series of the year, you got to take on Kent State and Central Michigan, which are two of the teams yeah. that did make the tournament. Of course, Central Michigan, they've been one of the big powerhouses in the conference. And then you look at Kent State, they're the team – that was the number one overall seed in the MAC tournament before losing to Ball State, uh, ultimately in the championship in the MAC tournament. One ball and no strikes. Bryce Smith recorded a three-run triple his last time up. He's the number nine hitter as the rain continues to fall here at Bob Wren Stadium. Ohio picked fifth this year in the MAC preseason poll. On the flip side, Youngstown State similarly picked fifth in the Horizon League preseason poll. 2-0 is golfed high in the air. Playable in the rain. R.J. Sherwood makes the catch. Taylor Gill tags and will score standing. A sacrifice fly for Bryce Smith. That's his fourth RBI of the game and Ohio is within two. 14-12 with one down here in the bottom of the fourth inning and the lineup card turns over to Cole Williams. Cole Williams walked twice in the third inning and grounded out back in the first. So, yes, Youngstown State, just like Ohio, as we mentioned, both projected fifth in their respective conferences. Youngstown State went 19-36 and 36 last year, but as we documented earlier, don't let that fool you because they ended the season winning 12 of their last 15 games, and they do return some of those key pieces to this year's team. Coach Bertinelli said that this is the deepest team that he's had in his eight years as a head coach. What we're finding out here on the pitching staff is they've utilized a lot of arms here today. Aiden English is the fourth pitcher in this game for Youngstown State. Owen won the count to Cole Williams. Yeah, English will give you a fastball and curveball combination, at least in terms of what he's been tested for. Some of these players, I get these stats from Prep Baseball Report. However, they add pitches right. every once in a while. They also add velocity. So not exactly right, but it gives you a decent idea, especially since we don't always have the time to get to see every single pitcher's uh, pitches that they throw. And not all coaches will want to reveal that either. Right. And we did see... Lane Rhodes start this game for Youngstown State, whose father, by the way, owns a baseball card shop. I, I learned that from Trevor Sharpie, one of the assistant coaches who I mentioned earlier. Lane Rhodes, then Niall Todd, Nolan Kabilis, and now Aiden English, who's just a sophomore making his third appearance. Only two-thirds of an inning so far this season as the 0-2 bounces onto the turf. Throw to second. He is not in time. Clay Cutter is there safely. So runner at second, only one out. And the Bobcats with their leadoff man at the plate, Cole Williams, senior from Charlotte, North Carolina. 
Nice work by Cutter with the heads up base running, but overall not a bad throw there from Francis. That one was online. It's a bit of a risk in that situation, especially given the conditions. That throw was perfect. So maybe a point if another Bobcat gets on first base, something to think about as well if there is a play at second base. One ball and two strikes. English fires low. Two balls and two strikes. Youngstown State, they, they won't open the Horizon League season this weekend. We talked about how they'll go to Georgia Tech for another test. Dan Bertolini, eighth-year head coach, talked about how each day is a new day. Despite this 0-9 record, we have the chance to compete each and every time we take the field. 2-2 two -two pitch is outside, three balls and two strikes. Youngstown State has only one winning season since 2006. That one time was 2021. However, they do have a very intriguing 2014 season to unpack. 3-2 pitch is outside, ball four, and Ohio has runners at first and second with one out for J.R. Nelson. Youngstown State had a losing season, not just a losing season that was close to 500. They had a losing season that was staggering when it comes to the wins versus the losses, but ended up winning the Horizon League Championship as the sixth seed, taking down Wright State. It's really an impressive season when you think about it, where with MAC tournament play and with any sort of March Madness situation, which we know from basketball, uh, in case of baseball, that goes in May. Um, but, you know, it doesn't matter how bad your regular season was, especially in Youngstown State's case. In the Horizon League, you only have six teams in that conference compared to a MAC that has 11 teams. So as a result, you know, every team has an opportunity. There's a nice off-speed pitch. And if you take advantage, you get hot at the right time, especially given that with a lot of mid-major teams, the talent levels tends to be pretty similar right. throughout the conference. There's not too big of a disparity. This can lead teams to get hot and sneak into the tournament. 0-2 oh the count. J.R. Nelson, the freshman shortstop, lunges at this and lifts it into shallow foul territory. Easy work for Trey Pancake for out number two. This will bring up Gideon Antle to close the door on that 2014 season. Youngstown State went 17 and 36, 6 and 17 in conference play. Again, that's a, a staggering difference, but found a way to win the tournament. That reminds me of, you know, those NCAA tournament teams that maybe had had a tough time during the regular season, but catch fire during March Madness and get into the big dance and maybe pull an upset or two. You're right. 15 win Liberty uh, about a decade ago. They made the tournament. Uh, you also got to think about is there's no wild pitch. And perhaps the moisture that continues to fall impacting these wild pitches. Ohio with runners at second and third, two outs. Uh, but then also another example, too, uh, Farley Dickinson from last oh, year. Oh, yeah. yeah you were in person, yes, for their upset over Purdue. And that's one thing I like about baseball as well, too. Uh, similar to how basketball, you see a lot of upsets. Baseball, you see a lot of upsets as well. You think of... Uh, Power five wins in these teams, they get opportunities against power five squads. Youngstown State, they're going to get that opportunity this week against Georgia Tech to try to take one. Um, they'll have more opportunities later in the season in midweek action to try to upset one of the big boys, so to speak. Uh, Bobcats will have that opportunity against Virginia Tech, and they've done that before as they have taken down uh, Kentucky in recent years, while Youngstown State, they have too. They upset Baylor yeah. in the last couple of seasons as well. One, two is a curveball fouled off. We, we've seen some steady rainfall now for a good, I'd say, 20 to 25 minutes. We want to give a, a major shout-out to our camera crew roaming the outdoors. Not roaming, stationary. Yeah. Having, having to basically stand statues still and maneuver these cameras in this weather. So shout-out to our camera crew and our whole production crew putting this on today despite the difficult conditions. It is. This is the first big baseball production we're doing this season. Our last game was YouTube production run by a little one cam thing I was doing uh, this past weekend. So to now have this, have all of our people here in attendance is great. Gideon Antle maybe didn't want to swing at that. It was in on the hands, but fights it off one and two. 
Gideon Antle with the big blast. His last time up, a three-run blast. Four home runs now on the season for the senior from Licking, Missouri, who entered this contest top 20 in the nation in batting average, second in the Mid-American Conference with a 513 average. Tenth start of the season today for the junior college transfer from Jefferson College. Has a chance to tie the game with one swing. Second and third, two outs. One, two is hammered. Deep down the left field line. You can forget about it. Gideon Antle does it again. His second three-run homer. And this one gives Ohio its first lead of the game. 15-14 in the bottom of the fourth. This is a Bobcat team that has no quit in them. No quit in them. We saw it from last season. Would that carry on to this year? You find yourself down 13 to 1. We knew how tough it was for the players. I got to go down on the field after their loss against UIC. A lot of disappointment throughout a lot of players' faces. But are you going to sit there and let that disappointment fester into a slump? Or are you going to let that make you do something about it? Well, the Bobcats certainly have done something about it today, Sam. It, it just feels like this game is personal. <laughs> I mean, these two teams have absolutely gone nuts offensively. A.J. Roush stabs at that bunt and misses strike one. Gideon Antle with two three-run homers in this game. He homered twice in one game earlier this season. I believe that was against Lipscomb and he does it again today, and this time with the rain falling and the ball breaking the, as well. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> <It was laughs> took the words right ball. out of my mouth. <laughs> yeah, and with that, we know that we were talking about how Coach Craig Moore, back when he was at Nebraska, had a 10 RBI game. Yes. Well, right now, Antle, we're not even halfway through this game right now, ideally unless the rain continues to stay like this, but Antle's got six RBI. It's a great point. 0-1 is upstairs and back to the backstop, 1-1. One one. Craig Moore, the head coach for the Ohio Bobcats in his third season, did have the interim tag in 2021. 10 RBIs in one game in, in 1999 with the Nebraska Cornhuskers. It ties, it is currently still tied for the most RBIs ever in a single game in Nebraska baseball history. Gideon Antle, to your point, has plenty of time. 1-1 one, one pitch. A.J. Roush takes inside one ball and two strikes. 15-14 lead for the Ohio Bobcats, who trail this entire game. And I say entire game. It feels like it's been an entire game, but it hasn't because we're only in the fourth inning. But they did trail the first three innings and now finally have a 15-14 lead. 1-2 pitch on the way from English. Up and in, 2-2. Two and two. Yep, this has already outscored a couple of football games uh, this year that the Bobcats have played. The <laughs> FAU game early on this season, a very low-scoring affair uh, for the Bobcats in that one. And, you know, it might be a long, long trip here. This is a roller coaster, and we might not be at the end of it just yet. And if it is a roller coaster, which we <laughs> certainly would like to compare that it, it is, this game feels like one. You're enjoying yourself. Oh, yes. I'm a roller coaster <laughs> enthusiast myself with now a coaster count of 110. Wow. Same as the marching band for the Bobcats, 110. Marching 110. I got my 110 roller coasters, as I like to say. 2-2 two -two is upstairs. Three balls and two strikes to A.J. Roush. Well, I can count on as many hands how many roller coasters I've been on. <laughs> Home plate umpire, by the way, Jimmy Craig. I didn't hear what he just said to the Youngstown State dugout, but it seemed like it was pretty definitive. We'll have to keep an eye out on that. I'm not sure if there was a warning or, or something issued, but he did take a second to take his mask off and say something to the Youngstown State dugout. Here comes the payoff. Upstairs, ball four. A.J. Roush walks for the third time today. Yeah, that's walk number 12, according to my count, for Youngstown State. It's tough as the rain continues, and I think this would incite... Uh, some of the coaching staff to talk about how this is really tough situation for a pitcher. Look at the pitch types that have missed high for English. It's been his breaking stuff, his curveballs, changeups, all of that stuff. And it's getting to the point where 
the rain is at such a high degree that it's just not applicable for guys to be able to pitch in this condition anymore. Yeah, and, and I mean, so we're not through five innings right now, so no. this is not a, a full game. But if if we get to that point and the rain keeps happening, that conversation may may have to be discussed. But hopefully that's not the case because I want to see this game play out. I do too, and I think <laughs> if you're Youngstown State, you'd be sick if the game had to end like this yeah. where, you know, you're up 13-1 to one and it's a four-inning game. And then the game ends, and you still find yourself on the wrong end of it. If it were the rain would have been stopped for the rain in the last inning, you would have been just fine, but not right here. But I think it's getting to the point where the field is so saturated. The outfield, you could see um, in the back, Tarpley kind of working with the track over there, uh, trying to get a feel for it. It's pretty difficult out there for fielders, too. And now the baseballs, think about how this changes the – way that the baseball lands when you have a hit into left center, hit into right center, it's just going to die. Right. It's just going to die more than likely in that grass. And with this field, we have an interesting one here at Bob Wren. It's half turf and then half natural grass in the outfield. Um, so it's the rain conditions affect it in a different way than your average all turf field or your average all grass field. Yeah, and I do think obviously the steady rain that's been happening for about 30 minutes or so because this infield is turf, that's why we're still playing. I mean, it, I, I feel like if this, this rain was happening with no turf infield, we'd have the dirt, the mud would really start to become an issue, and puddles would, would start to build up. But both head coaches are now finally, we're finally getting to the point where there is a discussion that's, ha that's, that's happening right now about the weather and you just hope that this, this, uh, this rain stops at some point because we have been treated to an unbelievable game. 15 to 14, drama through every single pitch. Yeah, 12 run comeback. Yeah. Multiple 10 run innings where if you look at the scoreboard right now, there's not double digits on the scoreboard. So it looks like two zeros. We're playing ball still, <laughs> and the fans, the fans are happy about it. The fans are intrigued. Now, all the fans have made their way to the covered areas here at Bob Wren Stadium, with, again, the exception of some fans who have umbrellas and our camera crew fighting the elements. Oh, my gosh. Some of them don't have their ponchos today either, which is difficult. I, I suspect... Each of these managers are saying, hey, let's get through at least one more inning here. If we can get through one more inning, get this game finalized, I think that would be very helpful uh, for both of these squads as well. Last thing you want to do is drive out all this distance and have none of this game count, especially from a hitter's perspective. Yeah. But I know for the pitchers, I think they'd rather this game be called off. <laughs> Cedric, Dan Bertolini, he, he's pretty hot right now. I, I, yeah. He just pointed at the home plate umpire, Jimmy Craig. I don't know what it was about. But there, there's a, there appears to be some sort of disagreement or verbal exchange about something that was just discussed. Yeah, might have been outvoted. Also, think about the situation he's in defensively. This rain is picked up to its highest degree with his pitching staff on the mound right now. And that's difficult, especially when you have a guy that leans on his breaking stuff. Here the Bobcats, come. you got to feel good yeah, right now. No doubt. With a one-run lead. Two down, bottom four, Trey Cassidy lashes this one into right field, a base hit, and Trey Law collides with A.J. Roush as Roush was rounding second base. Roush looked like he was going to take off for third, and the second base umpire, Bryce McCullough, says, yes, interference, you're going to go to third base. I think that's the right call. Trey Law just got in the baseline and blocked A.J. Roush there. That could have been, thankfully, both players are okay. Yeah, I am thinking the same way. I'm hoping that, again, with rainy conditions, that's another thing that can happen as well. A lot of slipping, a lot of it being a more difficult to have that wherewithal. Think about in baseball how much you depend on your senses to know who's to your left, who's to your right. You're using your hearing, you're using that. When there's rain, it becomes a lot more muffled. The wind that you might feel of a runner going past, that's not there as well, too. So it switches up more than you think when the conditions are like this. 
Alex Finney at the plate. And Finney takes inside on the corner, strike one. 15-14 is our score. If you're just joining us, you've missed a ton of action, obviously, just with the score speaking for itself. We saw 10 runs from Youngstown State in the top of the third. Ohio responded with 10 in the bottom of the third. His pitch slides down and outside, one ball and one strike. Gideon Antle has headlined the Ohio offense with two three-run homers in this game. And now Alex Finney looks to give the Bobcats. Every run right now is super important, especially when you, you think about the rain and if it continues, the umpires might be deciding some things once five innings are in the books. You never know. So A.J. Roush at third base trying to get that run in. Craig Moore and company. 1-1 one, one to Finney. Upstairs, 2-1. I feel like also the break that happened where the umpires had a meeting with the coaches, I think it was also helpful for giving some time for some of the baseballs to dry off a little bit as well because it feels like since that point, English has kind of got to take a nice breath in his pitching. It has been able to use some of those breaking balls. We saw the slider. We saw the change up a little bit now here, and this time tries to bring a little heat down low. But definitely seems to have a better grip than he did before. Yeah, and we haven't seen, or at least I haven't noticed, any sort of towel that's behind the mound at all. We've seen Aiden English just kind of grab at his pants to dry his hand off. Fifteen fourteen lead for the Bobcats in the bottom of. The fourth inning, two outs, three and one, the count to Alex Finney. One ball, or pardon me, runner at first and a runner at third. The pitch, Finney takes low, ball four, and Ohio has now drawn 14 walks in this game. And Alex Finney has walked three times. And now, Dan Bertolini is going to make a pitching change. The eighth-year head coach will remove Aiden English from this game. So we will take a quick break. The Bobcats have the bases loaded with two outs, leading 15-14 to 14 from Athens, Ohio. We'll be back.
15 to 14 lead for the Ohio Bobcats as we welcome you back to Bob Wren Stadium with Cedric Granger, Sam Hyman, Cam Appel, our field reporter. Rain continues to fall and the runs continue to pile up here in Athens. Pitching change, the new pitcher for Youngstown State, Casey Marshallwitz, the fifth year senior from Gibsonia, Pennsylvania out of Hampton High School, 6'2", 215 pounds. He's got a brother on this team, Cam. And he is in a tricky situation, but there are two outs, Cedric, and we'll see if some of his pitches can be the difference to get Youngstown State out of the jam. Yeah, it's pitch mix according to Prep Baseball Report. You got the fastball at around 87, curveball 72 to 74, changeup 76 to 78. He went with the fastball uh, for his first pitch there against Gill. Fifth appearance of the season for Casey Marshallwitz. His last appearance in inning and a third, two earned runs against the ACC opponent, Louisville. 1-0 is just inside, two balls and no strikes. Taylor Gill, way back about what feels to be 30 minutes ago, led this inning off with a double, and now he's batting for the second time. Ohio has batted around twice. Third inning did it, and... Here in the fourth, they've done it again. See, this is where the uh, the Carpenter scorebook comes through, where it has 15 innings to work with. How about <laughs> that? 3-0 pitch down and in, ball four. 15 walks from Youngstown State pitching. Ohio now leads it 16-14. They are seven away from 100 walks this season. Will they get there today? <laughs> I mean, anything is possible at this point. Clay Cutter, eight-hole hitter, and that skips to the backstop. Here comes Trey Cassidy, who scores. Make it 17-14, Ohio. Okay, now if the Bobcats continue to roll like this, they could do the reverse situation where they could end the game in seven themselves if they can get up ten. But then they also have to get it done with pitching, which, reminder, Adam Beery had the best inning of pitching that any Bobcat has had. But now he's been on the bench resting for a long time. Which, again, you wonder if that affects any sort of rhythm at all. 1-0 is low. Two balls and no strikes to Clay Cutter, who has walked twice and was hit by a pitch in the third. Senior from Centennial, Colorado. Spent two years at Iowa Western, a JUCO power in not only baseball, but also football. Cutter just got hit, so he's been hit twice today. And the bases are loaded again. Finney over at third, Gill at second, Clay Cutter at first, and here comes Bryce Smith. The first baseman for Ohio, graduate student from Virginia Beach, Virginia. First pitch, and that is on the top of the shelf for a strike, nothing and one. Seventeen to fourteen lead for Ohio here in the bottom of the fourth inning. Is that? Zooms inside, one ball and one strike with two outs, and the base is loaded. It's just, just unbelievable. You just sit there and you look at the screen, and you see it's 17-14. <laughs> Four innings. Just unbelievable. Unbelievable. A 1-1 one -one is smacked down the left field line. Could be trouble. Left fielder Kovas is there. Alejandro Kovas saves potentially a couple of additional runs, but Ohio puts up six in the bottom of the fourth inning, and the Bobcats lead 17-14 in this marathon slugfest in Athens, Ohio. We'll have the top of the fifth inning right after this from Bob Wren Stadium in Athens, Ohio.
We'll start at the top of the fifth inning. Cedric Granger, take it away with the play-by-play. -play. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad to be back in this game. 17 to 14. As we begin this fifth inning, Trey Law, Derek Tarpley, and Ian Francis leading off the frame. And it's Adam Beery who got a nice cheer on his first pitch strike. And then the next pitch is outside. One ball and one strike. And while we have a moment, we'll talk to Kim Appel once again, who was down there on the field. What did you hear? What you got for us? With the help of Gideon Antle, you could say the Bobcats have gained back some momentum. We recently asked Bobcats head coach Craig Moore what improvements he's looking to see in this team. He said he wants to see the team play better, clean baseball, putting that emphasis on the team's momentum. He stated, it's all about stopping momentum and retaking and regaining that momentum. Add in the weather from today and you'll definitely Definitely see that momentum Coach Moore talked about to keep pushing through a game like today. Yeah, you're right about that, Cam. This has an opportunity to be a huge win for the Bobcats, monumental, so to speak. If they can finish off this game and complete a 13-1 to deficit or come back from a 12-run deficit to win this, here comes the payoff. Breaking ball fouled backwards, and the count remains the same. Three balls and two strikes to Trey Law. What a cool moment there with the net if you're a fan of any aesthetically pleasing weather situations. As the ball hit the net there, the water from the net sprayed back. It was pretty awesome. 3-2, clocked up in the air. This one's in shallow left center field. J.R. Nelson slips, but who has his back? Cole Williams. <laughs> well, thankfully, J.R. Nelson is okay there. That, that looked like it could have been some Tough, tough sledding there, but good job by Cole Williams to be there in time. Yes, and when you think about this, there's certain cleats that players wear for turf and then wear for grass. Well, here on this stadium, you have to wear cleats that work for both. And when you have a play where you're used to the turf grass and then have to go into the outfield grass, I'm sure that's tough for Nelson. Yeah, very tough. Here comes Tarpley, who takes the first pitch slider for strike number one. We already know what he can do today. Has a home run to his name. It was a three-run shot in the third. Also had a double as he has lived absolutely up to the billing. Yeah, he has. I've been very impressed with Derek Tarpley Jr.'s approach. He's only a freshman, but has excellent work when it comes to getting his hands inside the baseball. He'll foul off the 1-1. I think something that's interesting, too, is when Coach Bertolini said, Hey, you know, he's having a slow start to the season. He's batting 250 as a true freshman, and he considered that a slow start. That speaks to how high his expectations are for him and how much upside he knows that Tarpley has. Yeah, I think he knows Tarpley has that upside. He saw him, obviously, in high school, but he watches him every day in batting practice. And he certainly doesn't hit 250 in BP. He's got so much potential. He'll pop up the 1-2 into shallow right field. A.J. Roush makes the catch on the run. Wow, back to, did we just witness something? Yeah, back. for the first time today, <laughs> it's two up, two down. <laughs> I, Adam I don't Beery. He's, I don't believe it. <laughs> he's come in, and he's really taken control of the game. We've been waiting to see if a pitcher would take control of the game, Sam. And, and so far, Adam Beery, even though there was a lengthy time in the dugout for the southpaw, he appears to be in control. First pitch breaking balls outside to Ian Francis. Player that walked in the first, had an RBI double in the third as a part of the back-to-back -back double sequence. That felt like an hour and some change ago. The next pitch on the money for strike number one. Wow, pretty, it, it, pretty, it's pretty wild that that was, the, that, I thought you were exaggerating, but that literally is the first time back-to-back -back batters have been retired. That's right. Yeah, there's <laughs> been a couple one-up, one-down situations, but that is the first time 1-1. One, one, that one is inside, and the count is two balls, one strike. So I think this is... Interesting that we've gotten to see the showcase for the Bobcat lefties here today as we've seen two of their lefty arms get the opportunity to pitch today. First Landon Price and then now Adam Beery. And against righty hitters, his slider is going to go up in on the hands. 2-1. And there you go, a perfect example of how a pitch went up on the hands. So base is clear in a 17-14 game, top of the fifth inning. Two balls, two strikes, and two away in the frame. Games can officially be counted as games once you go through five innings. So keep that in mind just in case this rain persists. 2-2 two -two pitch. Swing and a miss, strike three. 
second strikeout of the day for Adam Beery, and he's solidified the pitching staff here for the Bobcats. It started off with holes. There were some leaks, but who else to be the duck tape? Then Adam Beery, we're headed to the bottom of the fifth inning with the Bobcats up 17 to 14. Stay with us on Ohio Bobcat TV. The Bobcats have grabbed the bats for the start of this fifth inning. And Ohio, one of their keys today was to stack offense across innings. They only scored runs in three out of their 27 innings in their last series against UIC. Well, in this game, Sam, they have scored runs in three out of four, and they're looking to make it four out of five. Yeah, it's been pretty, pretty impressive to watch. Gideon Antle has headlined the offense with two three-run home runs. But when you look up and down the lineup, you can't find a batter that has not reached base tonight. So Marshall Witts trying to work into his first inning, still working into his first inning, came in for Aiden English in the last frame, working against the top of the order, Cole Williams, J.R. Nelson, and Gideon Antle. This is already their fifth time up to bat here in this fifth inning. The pitch finds the inside of the zone for a strike. Count is even, one ball, one strike. Marshallwitz fires on the 1-1, breaking ball hit to the right side. Nice sliding play by Stanley, turns around and gets at the first base in time. That was a really nice play by <laughs> Brett Stanley. Hey, that's where the, the moisture on the ground really helps because you're sliding and, and it, it, the slipperiness takes your body that way. And he made that look really easy. And I think he made the smart decision by quickly transitioning the ball, throwing it into the ground and knowing that that would still be enough to get the out. The rain has subsided a little bit as in comes J.R. Nelson. Shows Bunn at the first pitch, and the count is one ball and no strikes. That's been the goal for both of these teams. We saw the Bobcats find it with Adam Beery. Can Casey Marshallwitz be the answer for Youngstown State to keep them in the game? It's got to some, – somebody's got to step up, and for Casey Marshallwitz – a guy that hasn't appeared a whole lot this season has the opportunity to get in rhythm and perhaps the rain subsiding helps him focus. Count is even, one ball, one strike with one away to J.R. Nelson. He's originally from Vernon Hills, Illinois and attended Aldai Stevenson High School. 1-1 one, one home and that one's low and away. Count is two balls and one strike. One thing interesting about Nelson, of course his father Wrestled at Minnesota State University, and then his uncle played baseball at Northern Iowa Area Community College. So a lot of family ties. And you're going to see that throughout these rosters, even on Youngstown State's side, where, of course, the pitcher Casey Marshallwitz, his brother, 
is also a pitcher, his brother Cam, who instead of being a right-handed pitcher like his older brother, his younger brother's a left-handed pitcher. Yeah, really, really cool, fascinating dynamic there. And again, going back to J.R. Nelson, this is a guy that Coach Moore is very high on and told me before the season he has earned the opportunity to start. He's only a freshman. 2-2 Two -two on its way to Nelson, and that one is too low, gets to the backstop. But no harm, no foul with nobody on the base pass. Three balls, two strikes. And and the other real quick point on J.R. Nelson from Coach Moore. Coach Moore said, J.R. does everything you want an infielder to do. He's got the ability to change his arm slot on certain plays, make plays deep in the hole. He's a really gifted shortstop defensively. And that 3-2 plunks off of J.R. Nelson, so he'll get a free base. And the free passes continue to pile up for the Bobcats. They've enjoyed the opportunity to get on the base pass. And it's really set their hitters up well, especially this hitter, Gideon Antle. Yeah, well, Gideon Antle continue to make noise. He has two three-run home runs in this game. And his ability to, to what we discussed earlier, he has a great knack for, for hitting the curveball, hitting that off-speed pitch, sitting back and waiting and being able to adjust. All right, fastball, is it coming? Curveball, I adjust, keep my hands back, and go. So that'll be the challenge for Marshall Witz. He'll lay down a bunt up the middle. Marshall Witz tries to take one at first, but can't. It gets past Pancake in first base. And Antle takes second. Nelson to third off of the E1. Hey, in these wet conditions, might as well drop a bunt down every now and then and, and make the defense have to make a play in a pressure situation. Gideon Antle's speed. He's got speed and power. You know, he's not the tallest guy, but he does have sneaky power, as we know from his two home runs today. But he also can drop down a bunt just like that. And clearly, Marshallwitz wasn't prepared for it. This takes us to the right fielder, A.J. Roush. He looks at the first pitch for a strike. Roush has walked not once, not twice, but thrice tonight. Also grounded out in the second. So still looking for that first hit of the day. But he's been active on the base pass, scoring twice tonight. 0-1. That one's low and away. Count is one ball and one strike. This is a midweek matchup between Ohio and Youngstown State. Each of these teams will play plenty of midweek games throughout the rest of the season for the Bobcats. Up ahead, they have Moorhead State a week from today. And then a week after that, they play against Northern Kentucky. 1-1 one, one pitch. And maybe thought it could have clipped the side of the zone. But nevertheless, two balls and one strike. Yeah, earlier in this inning, Casey was locating his pitches a bit better, and now he's in a bit of a, a, tr a tough spot. A.J. Roush, a player that had some crazy good weeks throughout his career. Of course, March 22nd, he earned the MAC Player of the Week as he swings through that pitch. But on that week, he had three doubles, three home runs, and had a 1.235 slugging percent. Wow. So he's putting in work for the Bobcats. He'll look to do so here with two runners in scoring position. In comes the 2-2. Fastball cracked to the right side and foul. AJ is also a, a really good person, too. I've had the chance to chat with him. Both of us have. We, we've gotten the opportunity to speak to AJ, and he's first class, really all about business, but definitely always wants to learn every single time he's got the opportunity to. Here's the 2-2 home, breaking ball that goes off the glove of Ian Francis. And good work by Roush to work a high count. That's something the Bobcats have done successfully today. There's been some plate appearances where it's been a four-pitch walk or a five-pitch walk. But you also have to give Ohio some credit for some of these situations where, you know, the count was full and they were able to leverage walks. We'll see what happens, though, on this payoff. In comes the 3-2. Breaking ball swung on and missed for strike number three. First strike out of the day for Marshall Witz. A good mix of pitches there for Casey Marshall Witz in that sequence. A.J. Rouse did a great job, to your point, of laying off that curveball on the inside. It looked like it was going to break across the plate, but then Marshall Witz comes back there and puts it right down the middle and gives Roush a tough pitch to try and swing. Here's Trey Cassidy back up at the plate. 
Righty on lefty matchup, and Cassidy sees the first pitch decently well, but a tad late for strike number one. For Cassidy today, he has walked twice, and he has had two singles. So overall, two for two, two walks, and also has an RBI to his name, given that he earned a walk in a bases-loaded situation. So we'll take a look at that next pitch fastball, and he finds himself down in the count. And here's an opportunity that Youngstown State hasn't had a ton today, which is being up in the count, it gives you so much more variety in what type of pitch you can deliver. 0-2, swing and a miss, strike three, make it two Ks in a row for Casey Marshallwitz. And you know, right when I jump on play-by-play -play <laughs> in the fifth <laughs> inning, Sam, it looks like all the scoring has come to a screeching oh, halt. A scoreless goodness. fifth inning, how about that? As we are headed to the sixth here at Bob Rins Stadium. Keep, stay with us rather, on Ohio Bobcat TV. Five innings up, five innings down here in Athens, Ohio. It's been a day and a game of <laughs> many, many chapters. Let's see what the sixth chapter holds alongside our sideline reporter, Cam Appel, and, of course, color commentator Sam Hyman. My name is Cedric Granger. Happy to be here with you as the first pitch is a tad outside to R.J. Sherwood, who leads off the inning. Also expect Matt Thompson and Alejandro Kovas, the 4-5-6 heart of the order, to be due up in this frame. But Adam Beery, this is the type of performance you needed for the Bobcats, but he's looking to stay strong now in his third inning of work, and he finds his first strike on a breaking ball inside. Yeah, phenomenal work here from Adam Beery. He's mixing his pitches, and he's also working very quickly at the moment. You can tell when a pitcher is very quick to get on the mound and get back to work with that next pitch, that's a sign that they're in rhythm, and it's clear that's the case right now for Adam Beery. 17 to 14 lead for the Bobcats. And here comes the 2-2 to Sherwood. Swing and a miss, strike three. Chalk up a third strikeout for Adam Beery. Cedric, we're gonna have to come up with titles <laughs> for each chapter of this game. Each inning is, is a chapter, and we're gonna have to come up with titles because it's clear that the theme for the first couple, offense, but right now, completely different. It is, I think I have one for the third inning. I think it would be called Hang 10. <laughs> Each yeah. team did score 10 runs in the third inning. That's one of the reasons why the score is the way it is. Count is one ball, no strikes to Matt Thompson. He'll piece off the next pitch for strike number one. Thompson's been pretty productive today. Two runs scored, one for two from the plate, and has leveraged a walk. It's a Cats team that's lost six of their last seven, so trying to get the season back on track. As for Youngstown State, they are 0-9, seeking their first win of the season. And it looked like they might fly to that here today. And now a bunt laid down the third base, our first, that third base line, and good hit there for Matt Thompson on the bunt. And that's the second well-placed bunt we've seen today, Sam. 
Yeah, it is. And we've seen a lot of drag bunts. I, I asked Coach Moore, actually, what's what's harder, a drag bunt or a push bunt? And he said a push bunt. Drag bunt is a lot easier to place down that third baseline. I would agree. I played high school in base, in, uh, played high school baseball, and I, I definitely had more drag bunts than push bunts. But they're still tricky, and you got to be able to time it up perfectly. And, and Matt Thompson did that there. In comes the three RBI man. It's Kovas, who takes a look at the first pitch curveball for ball number one. As I mentioned with Kovas, two base hits today, had a two RBI single in the first, which really got Youngstown State going. And now they're trying to find that offense again. After scoring 10 runs in the third, they have had just one over their last two innings. Here's the 1-0 pitch, a little bit of heat. That's low and inside, and the count's two balls, no strikes. I think one of the challenges with being a baseball team in the North is that you have to travel on the road so often. In a lot of other sports, you do get at least a few home games dispersed in there, or there's just not as high of a frequency of games, Sam. And yeah. now in the case of Youngstown State, you're not playing a home game until the middle of March, and the season starts in the middle of February. Yeah, it can be tough, no doubt, just because you're you're away from your, your home territory. You're, you're enjoying better weather, but... Yeah, not being in the comfort of your own home, having to maneuver around a bit, it's challenging. 2-1 is drilled over to left center field. Antoine on the run and makes the catch in stride. Great first step from Gideon Antle. If we had a replay of that, you'd notice the, the path that Gideon took to that baseball. And it was a, a beautiful diagonal direction there from, from Gideon. You always want your first step to not be in no matter what happens when, when it comes to a fly ball, unless you know it's literally a, a blooper. And, and Gideon had a great first step to, to track that down. So two down in the inning with one runner on in, Matt Thompson. And here comes Trey Pancake. First pitch is for a strike. Is Youngstown State, they got a little bit of a theme going in there. Seven, eight, nine in the order. You got Trey Pancake. Of course, that's a <laughs> breakfast food. Brett Stanley, he played for Kellogg Community College in the cereal city of Battle Creek. So you got all types of breakfast down low in the seven, eight, nine as there's a swing and a miss for strike two. We go in almond milk yeah, with, with that cereal. <laughs> I, I've transitioned to almond milk, and it's not disappointed. It is delicious. It is very, very delicious. Great with cereal. Here's the 0-2, and that one's inside. It gets past Cassidy, and a free base there for Matt Thompson. I love how aggressive still both both of these teams are right now. This is It's been a long game, and this game is still up for grabs, so every single base runner and pitch is so important to make sure you're focused in on. Beery, he was a master at throwing strikes. Throughout his high school career, 110 strikeouts across 57 innings. And he'll look to get one more strike here to retire the side. One-two pitch. And Pancake gets a piece of it to stay alive. Hey, you brought up high school. Just found a really cool article about Adam Beery on the recordcourier.com website written by Jonah Rosenblum, who said that Adam Beery's fastball was surprisingly super fast, even at the age of 13 years old. He threw in the mid-70s. Well, that fastball is going to be cranked over to the right side and foul towards the bullpen. 13-year-old throwing a fastball mid-70s. That's, that's not normal. That's and how you become a person of legends right there. Yes. We talked about for years. Pancake is 0 for 2 on the day, does have a walk, and does have an RBI. Did have a ground out with a runner on the base pass. One runner on the base pass right now, 1-2. Hit to the left side, Gill in motion. Completes the 5-3 play to retire the side. Just seven batters faced in the last two innings for the Bobcats after Youngstown State was batting around the order. Night and day difference, just like how the weather has shifted as we head to the home half of the sixth. 17 to 14 lead for the Bobcats here on Ohio Bobcat TV.
Yes, you see the scoreboard right. 17 to 14 lead for the Bobcats. And at one point, this was a 12 to one lead for Youngstown State, but the Bobcats kept huffing, puffing, and chugging along in this game. And they have the lead now, 17 to 14. Welcome back to Bob Wren Stadium, where Alex Finney leads off. Taylor Gill and Clay Cutter also do up in the frame. The six, seven, eight in the order against Marshallwitz, who was on target in that last frame and looking to keep up that momentum. He does so with that first pitch strike. Marshallwitz, the fifth pitcher used today. And since the rain has subsided, you've seen the pitchers have a lot better hold of their breaking stuff. And that's been to the benefit of both Beery and Marshallwitz. Yeah, we've seen a handful of wild pitches earlier in the game. Not the case right now. Next pitch is upstairs and outside. Two balls and one strike to Alex Finney, who's got a pair of walks. Actually make that a trio of walks and a pop fly to his name. Everybody getting their work in this week. You'd have to think, having these midweek games, this adds a little bit more of a challenge to the regular season. It's nice that you start off the year with just the weekend series only, and then you implement some of those weekday games as well, and that kind of prepares you for what you're going to see in minor leagues and in summer league baseball. Yeah, having to play a lot of baseball, and again, these midweek games, the way they're designed, you, you typically, some, some coaches in college baseball call these midweek games a bullpen day, where it's just, you know, uh, Luke Luke Olson, he did give up three runs in the top of the first inning, but I, I'm certain if he was pitching on a Friday or Saturday, they would have let him go a little bit longer than just at one inning. So you do get the chance to see a bunch of different pitchers get opportunities. I will say one thing to note, Ohio will play Northern Illinois this weekend. NIU actually does not have a midweek game this week, so you wonder if they'll be more rested. Will that play a factor? Who knows? Certainly could. Here's the payoff. Finney taps that one foul backwards, and the count remains the same. Three balls and two strikes. Finney's a player that's shown some great improvement throughout his Ohio Bobcat career. He hit 108 in his first two seasons, and then it just kind of clicked for him. He's hovered around 300 as a hitter since 2022. Going into this game, he's batting 215, or 250 rather, and he fouls off another pitch. But these are the type of plate of appearances that I wanted to see the Bobcats have this past weekend against UIC where you're forcing these pitchers to, you know, pitch to you seven, eight, nine times. It certainly makes a difference in driving guys out of the game. And in case of the Bobcats, they drove out the starter in two innings after playing UIC where they had starters go seven, seven, and eight, respectively, in that three-game series. Yeah, if you're Ohio going into this weekend, you definitely want to get to the point where your starters are at least pushing into the fifth to avoid arm troubles. And there's a well-earned walk for Alex Finney to lead off the frame. That is now walk number 16. Wow, is all I can now say. I'll say this, Sam, I don't think I ever need to go on a walk again. I've seen all the walks <laughs> I need right here. We, we certainly have. It has been unbelievable. Here's Taylor Gill up at the plate. And takes ball number one down low. Gill's got a pair of walks in this game. He also had a double. And that was back in the fourth inning to get things started. It was great. It really set the tone for that fourth inning in which the Bobcats scored six runs. So you said 16 walks for Ohio right now, I think? Yes. we have. That's almost as many walks as they've had this entire season, 21 walks. Yep, that's right. Yeah, I had that number in the uh, left corner where they had 21 <laughs> walks and 66 strikeouts. And that walkout to strikeout ratio, it's going to be looking pretty good after this game here. I have a Bobcat striking out four times in this game, and they have walked 16. Inversely, for Youngstown State, 79 walks to 51 strikeouts going into this matchup. Here's 3-0. And that one just clips the top of the zone on the fastball. Counts three balls in, one strike. With the Bobcats, like I mentioned before, after starting off the season 2-0, they had that tough road trip against Campbell in North Carolina. And then was able to take one. As runner goes, pitches the ball to throw down. Wouldn't have mattered anyway. 
Yeah, ball four. Taylor Gill will head down to first base. So one thing's for sure, one thing's for certain, I should say, since the top of the fifth inning, Ohio continues to at least threaten. They have not scored yet in the in the uh, middle innings when you factor fifth and sixth, but they've had more runners on base and they continue to play that aggressive card here as we see a bunt attempt on the way. Clay Cutter showing bunt early. Infield pinched in, and the first pitch breaking ball fouled backwards for a foul ball. Ohio with two aboard. I did mention keys earlier in the game, Sam. I never got to say them all in a row, but it was to sustain offense across innings, to limit walks, and have better at-bats. Too many quick innings where they suffered their fair share of one, two, three innings against UIC. That has not been a struggle at all today as the 0-1 breaking ball. Hit to the left side, step on third base back for one, the long throw across, and they say it's a foul ball. So never mind what I said there. <laughs> well, I, I started a double play. At first I was like, wait a second, Clay Cutter just stopped running, and I'm not sure why, but now I know why. Yep, Matt Thompson was getting ready to try to secure a double play, which was a theme early on in the game against Lane Rhodes' Cutter. The Bobcats hit two double plays, or hit into two double plays in that situation, and it cost them runs early. And then once he left, is that ball's lined in the left center field. That's down for a base hit. Here comes Alex Finney with the windmill. He's headed to home plate, and he's safe. An RBI single for Clay Cutter, and the Bobcats have their largest lead of the night. Great piece of hitting from Clay Cutter. He kept his hands inside that baseball, did not extend out and thus would have missed or hit the inside of the bat, not barrel that ball up. Really nice job by Clay Cutter, who's making his fifth start ever at Ohio, the Iowa Western transfer. Well, thank you, Clay Cutter, because I was a little bit scared that my two innings of play-by-play, <laughs> -play, there would be no scoring as there's a wild pitch. That ball gets away from Ian Francis, and the runners each advance Gill to third and Cutter to second. It would have been pretty... Wild <laughs> if that happened. I see what you did there. No wonder we get along so well. <laughs> <laughs> the Bobcats now lead 18 to 14. But despite that, Youngstown State has out hit the Bobcats tonight 11 to 9. And here comes head coach Bertolini to talk with the squad here. Yeah, I think. Pitching change, it looks like. Yep, I just think he just took the baseball from Marshall Witz. He has seen enough. As we'll see who will be next to pitch for Youngstown State. Is Again, you've got to imagine they've utilized almost every pitcher that they expected. Maybe we'll see Trevor Sharpie, former uh, Nevada Wolfpack standout. Yeah, former St. Cloud Rocks, <laughs> proud Northwoods League member. But we'll take a short break. When we come back, we will break down the new pitcher. 18-14 to 14 lead for the Bobcats here at Bob Wren Stadium. New pitcher into the game for Youngstown State. It's Chase Franken. He's a nice utility player for this squad as he can play in the outfield. Also can come in to pitch. Stands at 5'9", right-handed pitcher from Salem, Ohio, which has been an area that Youngstown State really loves to recruit in. 
but he'll look to, for lack of a better term, Frankenstein the pieces left over from <laughs> Casey Marshallwitz, who provided, I'd say, the best pitching performance. Him and Rhodes have been the top two pitching performances for Youngstown State this evening. Yeah, I was impressed with Casey Marshallwitz. He mixed up his pitches really nicely. And one thing that we've also noticed from Youngstown State, some different arm slots as well throughout throughout these pitchers, which and different types of pitchers, right? You start off with Lane Rhodes, who is a sinker baller, slider, changeup. Get into uh, Niall Todd, Noah Kabilis, changing of their, their arm slots. One was a side armor. And uh, now we get into Chase Frankie, and we'll see what he has to offer for the Penguins. So up to bat for the Bobcats, it is Bryce Smith, who's having himself an evening. Four RBI night. And look to keep that going with two runners in scoring position. Pitch put on the ground over to the left side. The shortstop law is none, not in time to first base. Look at that by Bryce Smith. That's why you always leg it out. And it was a good job originally by Law to halt the third base runner and the second base runner. But as a result, he wasn't able to get the ball to first base in time. Yeah, I think, well, Trey Law did everything right when it came to fielding that baseball. He kept his glove down, he kept his eyes down on the ball, and then did a great job of looking over at third base. But I just think he looked over there a little bit too long, Cedric. And I think you want that half a second glance, and then you got to make the decision. I think he took about a second too long, and that's what cost him. Bases are now juiced for Cole Williams. As when we take a look at Chase Franken, he's played in two games this year, one and two-thirds innings pitched. He struck out two and has walked two. His last appearance came against Louisville, where he pitched two-thirds of an inning. The 1-0 sells outside count is two balls and no strikes. And like we said many, many times today, Sam, bases loaded situation for the Bobcats where they have mashed in this sequence. And now with the top of the order up, they're looking to do the same. Ball put on the ground to the right side. Nice glove there from Stanley. Stanley gets it in time to the pitcher to at least retire one. But the Bobcats get a run across. It's Taylor Gill scoring. It's 19 to 14 Bobcats. Well, there Brett Stanley was trying to make it a split second decision there with his communication with Trey Pancake. And the two did a phenomenal job. But give Ohio credit, you know, it's not just the two three-run homers from Gideon Antle. A lot of small ball we're seeing. And, and that's one thing that Craig Moore, as this pitch is on the outside corner for a called strike, a curveball. Craig Moore did tell me, and I'm sure he's told other people about his team this season. He said, look, we're, we're not going to always rely on sitting back hitting the three-run homer. We're, we're going to be a small ball team. We're going to really get on base. This ball should stay in the infield. Ian Francis looking for it, and some good communication by the Penguins. So, yeah, you know, going back to that point Craig Moore made when I asked him about his team, he was very decisive in saying, look, we're not going to be that team that sits back and hits the three-run home run. Now they did hit two three-run home runs today thanks to Gideon Ansel, but look how they're scoring in other ways. They've got 19 runs. They're not all home runs, right? They're being... Very selective, and their base running has been solid, and they're playing the small ball game too. Yeah, letting the game come to them, so to speak, as that breaking ball swung on and drilled to left field, down for a base hit. Here comes Cutter. He scores. Bryce Smith right behind him. He scores as well, and make it a double for Gideon Antle. His amazing day continues with now eight, count them, eight RBI. He wants 10. <laughs> My goodness. Great piece of hitting there from Gideon Antle. Really was right all over that pitch and struck it down the left field line. 21 runs. That is not a typo. Yeah, this looks like a football score. Are we watching a, a football game, 21 to 14? The next batter up is A.J. Roush. Got a runner in scoring position, but just to the same point you were saying, Sam, right on cue, Bobcats able to move runners around the bases by hitting gap to gap. Yeah, as that pitch is fouled off, it's a big part of this offense. Look, you lose some of your key pieces from last year. Colin Kasperbauer, Alec Patino, Mason Minzy, Will Sturrock, four of the top six hitters in terms of hit totals last year. They still have a ton in the tank this season. One of those returners, though, is A.J. Roush. 
who in 2023 bat 257 with 19 RBI. He also led the team in runs scored. He scored 40 runs. Right now he's down in the count. One ball and two strikes against Franken. Here comes the one-two. And he doesn't take the cheese on the inside pitch. The Penguins have led by as much as 11 in this game. And now the Bobcats up by seven. Speaking of sevens, number seven up at the plate. And here comes the 2-2 two -two to Roush. Chops that one over to the left side. And, oh, a diving play by Law, but he's got no throw. We've seen some nice plays by the infield to prevent some of these hits from going to the outfield. But unfortunately for Law, he's been put in do-or-die situations where, you know, you can't win either way. And I want to go back to Ohio's offensive approach. Look, I know it's these these are crooked numbers here, but you, you have to you have to unpack the fact that the Bobcats have been excellent at the plate. You know, they're putting the ball in the play. That that hit right there from AJ Roush is not the prettiest of hits, but he puts the ball in play and makes the defense have to do something. Here's Trey Cassidy up at the plate. As for the third time today, the Bobcats have all nine batters hit in one inning. So impressive stuff. Here's the 1-0 pitch, runner goes, pitches a ball to throw down to second base is too high. Good jump there by A.J. Roush to get the stolen bag. Yeah, and this Ohio team also is a lot faster and Coach Moore said will be a lot more aggressive this season. A.J. Roush is one of those guys that is going to be aggressive on the base paths. Count is three balls, no strikes to Trey Cassidy, who also has a little bit of that baseball legacy in his family. His dad, Kirk, played baseball in the Miami Marlins system, hence why even though he's from the, right around the Detroit, Michigan area, he's a fan of both the Marlins and the Tigers. Yeah, pretty cool stuff. Hopefully we get a chance to meet his father and maybe pick up some words of advice that he's passed along to his son Trey. Here's the 3-1 home and he'll clock that one in the air over to right field but plenty of room for Sherwood. Makes the catch and retires the side. So the Bobcats, they get a little scoring bonanza going here in the sixth inning. Four runs to extend their lead to 21-14. to Call it a football score. Bobcats by a touchdown as we begin the touchdown inning, the seventh inning here at Bob Wren Stadium. Welcome back to Bob Wren Stadium, where the Bobcats lead 21-14. I enjoyed my two innings of play-by-play, -play, but the man to take you through the rest of the way of this fantastic game, I pass it along to Sam Hyman. What a toss. <laughs> and I secure the toss. You secure Make the, the catch. Toss. Here we hey, go. You know, call it an alley-oop and you've dunked it. That's how we say it. <laughs> Love it. 
21-14, folks. 21-14 is our score as we get set to start the top of the seventh inning. This game started around 4 o'clock. We are past the three-hour mark, 7.06 on the East Coast. We've seen a lot. We've witnessed a lot. And now we get to witness a top bullpen arm for the Bobcats, the right-hander Patrick Straub, the redshirt junior from Naperville, Illinois, 6'3", 205 pounds, makes his fourth appearance of the season through three appearances. He's thrown five innings, only four hits, two earned runs, and four strikeouts. Before we start the top of the seventh, though, how about we rewind back to a little bit of Adam Beery here, Cedric. What impressed you the most about Adam? Three innings, only one run allowed, and three strikeouts. Yeah, number one thing, it's got to be command. If you're throwing a three- or four-pitch mix, in Beery's case, a four-pitch mix, you've got to have great command of the zone and the ability to throw multiple pitches for strikes. Well, Beery, even throughout the rain that happened, throughout all the conditions, he threw multiple pitches for strikes, and he really took control of the game when the game was reeling away from the Bobcats, and that's allowed Ohio to really build this lead. It started with pitching and defense. That's what Coach Moore always says determines games. And Beery, pitching, and then the defense behind him, making plays. Absolutely. So here we go, top of the seventh, Teddy Ruffner, the designated hitter junior from Mars, Pennsylvania. So on planet Earth, <laughs> in case you're That's wondering. That's got to be an interesting city name yeah. right there. you you got to go to a, a school that wears red as a result of that. <laughs> the red planet now on the red team. Mars Area High School, a two-sport athlete Teddy was at the high school level. He takes low, two balls and no strikes. Four years of football for Teddy Ruffner during his high school career. He rushed for nearly 3,500 yards in two seasons. That is a strike on the outside corner. And then also three years of baseball. Hit 367 his senior year. And now he is here at Youngstown State. The junior now waits the 1-2. 2-2. Two. Two two. Yeah, it's always impressive when you see guys that play multiple sports at a high level. It's something that's become a bit of a lost art because it feels like if you want to compete at baseball at the highest level, you've got to play as many sports as possible. You've got to be constantly playing games. And that pressure forces guys, you know, to play baseball year-round. However, when you're a guy that can play some football, maybe play some basketball, uh, play a different sport, maybe volleyball or tennis, it can be so helpful just for being able to keep yourself healthy throughout a season. 3-2 pitch. Swung on and missed strike three. Patrick Straub with his first strikeout, first batter he faces tonight is a frontwards K. And that'll bring up Brett Stanley, the second baseman. So Ohio pitching last three innings now. Retired the, the leadoff batter. Yeah, great work by Straub there. That was the breaking ball. Uh, with his pitch mix, it's pretty interesting. So got the fastball at 89, curveball uh, 77 to 78, slider 64 to 72. A lot of disparity there. And then the changeup 79 to 80. Uh, the thing about his fastball, though, according to Ben Hamilton, who used to play for the Bobcats last year, he mentioned how it's a cutter fastball, and mm. that one's really tough. That one breaks to the quickly to the right or quickly inside, depending on your handedness, and it makes it a struggle to hit. If you want to compare that to a major league baseball pitcher, Corbin Burns, who was on the Brewers for a long time and now on the Orioles, he is great at throwing the cutter. So is Mariano Rivera. That's right. That's <laughs> right. Best closer in history. 1-1 one, one is swung on and missed for strike two. Also to note is Patrick's arm slot, that three-quarters release. I wouldn't call it a submarine or even below that that 90-degree angle, if you will, as the 1-2 is scorched foul right side into some of the green foliage near the Ohio softball field. But it is a different arm slot and can be tough to adjust to. Brett Stanley singled, walked, and was hit by a pitch in this game, and he hammers that one foul, same spot. I really like Straub in his last performance against UIC. Two innings pitched, one hit, and he just felt like he had total control of the game as soon as he came in for that matchup against the Flames. That was in the Sunday game in which the Bobcats lost 7-3 to in the rubber match of that series. However, he pitched very well. 1-2 pitch. And that pinches inside, two balls and two strikes to Brett Stanley, the junior from Washington Township, Michigan. 
Yeah, that time he went with the changeup. Uh, good pitch when you're up in the count to see if you can get a batter to swing and miss or chase something. That one was on the inside for Stanley. 2-2 two -two pitch, swung on and missed, strike three. What a start out of the bullpen for Patrick Straw. Back-to-back -back strikeouts, two away in the top of the seventh inning. Yeah, there it is, Sam. That one was the cutter, devastating. You saw how he went light on the speed, change up inside, and then goes quickly, fast speed, probably 89, 90 mile per hour cutter outside. That's devastating for a hitter to try to hit. Really good mix up and pitches there, and he's back to work quickly as he fires that one just outside and low. One ball and no strikes to Trey Law. Shortstop, redshirt senior, last year's second team All-Horizon League. And this pitch sails back to the net, two balls and no strikes. Trey Law has played in 119 career games at the, high, uh, at the, the college level, rather. Primarily a position player in college, but he also dabbled in pitching at the high school level. 2-0 is outside. It's 3-0. Cedar Cliff High School, 2017, flashback, led the team and threw a complete game to help capture the squad's third district three baseball title since 2011. 3-0 is outside, and Trey Law heads down to first with a four-pitch walk. Actually, that game was at First Energy Stadium in Akron. Have you ever been to the Akron's uh, Rubber Ducks? Rubber Ducks. Of course. You, yeah. you know I've been to the Rubber That's probably <laughs> one of my favorite minor league baseball Rhetorical teams. question. Yeah, Canal, uh, Canal Park. They changed uh, the, it. Yeah, it it used to be First Energy, right? Yes, I yeah. believe so. Yeah, yeah. Canal Park now because uh, there is like a little canal that's built in over there. Great place to watch a ball game up there in Akron. But – I don't know. I feel like it's been Canal Park as long as I remember, so I want to make sure that that first energy state, it might be a, be a different team. Let's yeah, see. we'll see. I could have been wrong. But first energy, I mean, they're huge with Cleveland and Akron and that whole area, but I believe uh, at least first energy is a big sponsor. There's some sort of connection there. Yeah, naming rights changes yeah. so quick now. I mean, even... Growing up, if you grew up as a, uh, as a Bengals fan in Ohio, you know, you're always going to call it Paul Brown, not Paycor. You know what? I think it was actually the Reading Fight and Phil's first uh -huh. energy stadium. Very interesting. That's going to be a team I might be not too far away from, as it seems like. Yeah, it, it, was, it was. And that makes sense because Trey Law is from Pennsylvania. First energy stadium, the home of the Reading Fight and Phil's. <laughs> I love Great that atmosphere. Name. It seems like Straub, some things have been off. As, you know, he was on the money for a lot of his first couple of pitches, and now has thrown six straight balls. Yeah, and now Tim Brown, pitching coach, is out there chatting with Patrick Straub. Tim Brown has been, wow, his, his resume, coaching stops all over the place. He's moved around quite a bit. Eastern Illinois, USC Upstate, Lincoln Memorial Division II school in Harrogate, Tennessee, middle of nowhere. Not a lot of stuff going on there, but there is a pretty darn good Division II program, LMU. George Washington, Coppin State, Siena College. Tim Brown has been around the block and then some. It is, and he's really worked with some fantastic pitchers too, including Will Klein, a right-handed pitcher who was selected in the fifth round uh, by the Kansas City Royals. He worked with him when he was at Eastern Illinois. Yeah, Tim Brown actually... Speaking of Eastern Illinois, while he was at Eastern Illinois, as Derek Tarpley Jr., the center fielder, squares to bunt. 3-0 is a strike. 3-1 with two down. Top of the seventh, 21-14 Ohio. Tim Brown actually had his eye on Luke Olson, helped bring Luke Olson to Ohio when Luke was at Danville Area Community College before Ohio. The Juco transfer as Derek Tarpley Jr., Heads down to first base, and there are now runners at first and second after back-to-back -back walks from Patrick Straub. So it looked like Straub was in the driver's seat for what was going to be a 1-2-3 inning. Not the case. Ian Francis now at the plate, the junior from Youngstown, Ohio.
Now seven walks for the Bobcats, so a little bit higher than their season, season average, which is just a little bit over six walks per game. I will say something that's going to go up for both of these teams is their runs per game. Youngstown State, they only average two runs per game mm. going into this matchup. I think a, a big 14 added to that at <laughs> minimum is going to help. And this gets away from the catcher. Cassidy off his mitt. Both runners advance. We'll see if that goes down at, as a wild pitch or a passed ball. It looked like Cassidy had a chance to squeeze it. Law moves up to third. Tarpley over to second. So working with guys with different styles of fastball, I think it's pretty important to notice that as well too because as a catcher, it could be a little bit more difficult to catch a guy that's maybe a cutter as opposed to a guy who throws a four-seamer constantly. 2-0 is right down the middle. Two balls and one strike. Second and third, two outs, top of the seventh. Here's the 2-1. And this is line into right center field, down for a base hit. Trey Law claps his hands and scores. Here comes Derek Tarpley Jr. It's a two-run single for Ian Francis, who now is up to three RBIs this evening. That's a good piece of hitting for Youngstown State. And also, that's how you build some momentum. The two walks in a two-out situation, they come back to bite Straub there. You don't walk those guys, you find yourself right. out of the inning. And now, just like that, Straub's out of his rhythm in Youngstown State. This is your last chance to really surge. I mean, there's still plenty of time in this game, and we've seen how things can change in an instant. But there was a middle part of this game where Youngstown State, they had didn't sustain any offense whatsoever. So to finally get their groove back a little bit, that could be huge for them as they may not be done. 21-16 now here in the top of the seventh inning. Two balls and no strikes to R.J. Sherwood. A senior from Canton, Michigan. Right fielder looking for his first hit today. Two a pitch is swung on and missed. Strike one. Yeah, Sam, I talked about Ohio's three keys where Youngstown State's theirs were to find that power surge again. I could say they definitely did that. <laughs> Limit walks, that's an X. But on this third one, hit well in two out scenarios. Here we go. Can they do it? Ground ball, dribble towards short. Tough play. J.R. Nelson. He made it. Wow. The freshman, we talked about how he can have such an impact on this game from a fielding perspective, not just his bat. And he came to play today. What an effort at the shortstop position. We go to the bottom of the seventh. It's time to stretch. We deserve to stretch. I think so. 21-16 is our score. Bottom of the seventh is next from Athens. Bottom of the seventh inning here at Bob Brent Stadium, Ohio University. Back with Cedric Granger, Cam Appel, I'm Sam Hyman. 21-16, ladies and gentlemen. This game has had all types of fireworks. And Chase Franken remains out on the mound for 
the Penguins. Six pitchers used for Youngstown State in this game. Ohio's used five. And we get set to start the bottom of the seventh inning with Alex Finney leading things off for Ohio. Bobcats looking to get to four and six on the season. Youngstown State trying to pick up its first win of the season, 0 and nine. Franken delivers and that misses upstairs. One ball and no strikes. 12 hits apiece, but a difference 21-16 in the run column. Ohio hit the 20 run mark actually last season. So this is not the most runs that Ohio has scored. Ohio scored 27 runs last year in one game against Navy back on February 19th. That final score was 27 to nine. And Ohio had 20 hits in that game as this is fouled off of Alex Finney's shin. I mean, that's just a touchdown and an extra point away, you know, <laughs> at this point. You're right. It is. I think this is one of those chances where, you know, anybody on social media, like, go tweet out about this game, tweet out about the score, spread the word, because this is Please. something that could certainly get some notoriety, I think. Yeah. No doubt about it. And would be both great for both programs uh, just to get their baseball programs even more on the map on Twitter, on Instagram. I mean, I've seen social media posts where Gideon, Gideon Antle has been there and some of our – other students, they've been following along on social media. Um, Ryan Finn, who was my color commentator this past Sunday, he saw there were graphics with Gideon Antle as like um, Division One baseball players that are starting off the season red hot. So, you know, people are watching. People are noticing. Tap in because it might be too late by the time these guys head off to the next stop. Line drive right at the third baseman. Matt Thompson snatches it out of thin air. And Alex Finney is retired, a hard line out. But yeah, Gideon Antle having a great season so far. He has eight RBIs. He's due up. He's definitely going to get at least one more AB. And he has nine, uh, no, he has eight RBIs. Yes, in unless this game. the Bobcats can find a way to put up five in this. But I think if they do find a way to put up five in this inning, it would usually, it would have to be by an RBI by end. So, I mean, <laughs> it, it's not a foregone conclusion, but I'd be willing to, if I was a betting man, I'd be willing to put some money down that if the Bobcats score five runs to walk off the game here in the seventh, that would be the man that closes the door. Taylor Gill hammers this one down the right field line, and that ball is just foul, but a lot of oohs and ahs here in the uh, in the stands. That, that was close. Very much so. That's got to be frustrating if you are in the batter's box. Taylor Gill in that situation. You get the pitch well, maybe just a tad early, but not – it was a well-hit ball. And it's right there on the line. Of course, the umpires, they see it better than we do and also cut them slack. They have been out there in the rain. They've been out there dealing with the coaches, battling back and forth. They chose to help keep this game continue, which has been very nice. I'm very thankful to continue calling this game because it's certainly been entertaining. Uh, but it actually even speaks to a bigger point, how big this has been in terms of just the endurance and the persistence for all these players and coaches and camera people, everybody that's worked this production, and the fans for sticking through this game. It's a long game, and it's had a lot of chapters. This one fouled off, still one and two. Yeah, we are approaching three and a half hours of baseball right now. Gives you that sort of minor minor league baseball grind feel. Yeah, by the way, there's a pitch clock. There, there is a pitch clock. Yeah, a 20-second <laughs> pitch clock, but it doesn't feel like we've had a pitch clock. <laughs> one, two. Swung on and missed, strike three. Taylor Gill is retired at two down. Gill, is he's in his first season with Ohio, has had a pretty solid day. Three walks, a double, a run scored. Two runs scored, I should say. Here comes Clay Cutter, who has reached base all five times today. Two walks, two hit by pitches, and an RBI single his last time up. And he waves through that offering, with nothing but air, strike one. One thing that impresses me about Franken after coming off that strikeout, uh, being a two-way player, we don't see that too terribly often. I remember we did see a player on Central Michigan last season that did have the um, 
capabilities to be both way player and he's made four starts or at least has appeared in four games in the batting order and it's just an asset for a team to have especially when you might be short on arms you can compress that on your travel roster into one guy when you can do both 0-2 oh, is upstairs two uh, one ball and two strikes yeah that's a that's a benefit to have and I, I think you know one guy we actually haven't seen tonight Cedric is Pauly Mancino, who could potentially dabble in pitching as well as outfield. He's been playing right field the majority of this season. He started all nine games coming into tonight, getting the day off today. But Pauly has a heck of an arm, uh, according to Craig Moore. And, you know, maybe, maybe one time he'll get an opportunity. You never know. He did it in high school at Ignatius, which is the same high school that Billy Adams attended. So that pipeline continues, which is pretty awesome. Not the only Bobcat, too. B Billy Adams is not the only Ohio Bobcat to attend Ignatius. Two balls and two strikes. And that misses upstairs three and two. Tyler Finkler, former Ohio Bobcat, who is the defensive player of the year on the 2017 Ohio team that won the MAC championship, also went to St. Ignatius High School. This is grounded foul, still three and two to Clay Cutter out of the eighth spot. Yeah, it's a fantastic school. And I know a lot of the Catholic schools being from one of them as St. Charles is what I attended in Columbus. They have great baseball traditions all over the place. Three, two, and it hits Clay Cutter, who has been a ball magnet tonight. Cedric, he, he's been hit three times so he might he might have some bruises, but he'll take the bruises in exchange for a win, I'm yeah. sure. Fortunately for him, this is baseball, not dodgeball. Getting hit <laughs> with the ball gets you a base as opposed to getting you out of the game. Bryce Smith takes low, one ball and no strikes. 21 to 16. Ohio in front. And we are in the bottom of the seventh inning. Franken delivers. 1-0. Sails high. Two balls and no strikes. And time is called as Ian Francis will jog out to the mound. Quick conversation. There you go. I can hear the church bells in the distance signifying that we are officially three hours and 30 minutes into this game. <laughs> <laughs> how, did, how did those church bells know? <laughs> 63 degrees here in Athens right now. Won't be that way this week. <laughs> no, unfortunately not. 2-0 is on the inside corner for a strike. You want, but well, you know, Sam, we can't. We said there was supposed to be no rain today. And what did we get? You're right. We, so did, you get, never know. we did get some rain. And the last time NIU played the Bobcats here in Athens, it was one of the craziest weather sequences you will ever see. Fly ball down the left field line, drifting foul into the Ohio bullpen. Two and two. So here on Ohio Bobcat TV, uh, Cade Williamson, who's now our uh, PA announcer for Ohio baseball, he was on the call with Carl Blaylock, a good friend of mine. And uh, the game started off 60 degrees, supposed to be a doubleheader between NIU and the Bobcats. Started 60 degrees by the ninth inning. 30 degrees and snow falling. Mm. Was that last year or two years ago? Two years ago? Yep. Okay. On the outside corner, called strike three. Great work, Chase Franken. Pitches a scoreless bottom of the seventh and strikes out Bryce Smith. So that retires the side. We head to the eighth. Ohio with a 21 16 advantage. We'll be back from Athens, Ohio.
Top of the eighth inning, 21-16 lead for Ohio over Youngstown State. New pitcher is Hudson Bonkel. We'll get into him in just a moment. But we have another update from our field reporter. Let's say hello once again to Cam Appel. Thanks, Sam. We've seen a lot of competitive players out on the field today, but A.J. Roush is known as a competitor on this Ohio team. Last season, he said his mindset for that season was being competitive at the bat, doing everything he can to help the team when runners are in scoring position and drive them in, just getting in the position to score. A.J. said the definition of a competitor at bat to him is not chasing pitches when the fastball is there, being on time with it, and trusting that approach you're going up to the plate with and follow it. Yeah, he's been very disciplined too today, Cam, at the plate with three walks and an infield single as well. Really nice to see A.J. Roush continue to blossom. He, he entered this game hitting above 300. This is a ground ball right back up the box. Alex Finney makes the play, one up, one down. And Matt Thompson is retired. I actually think that hit Hudson Bonkel, so if you want to get fancy with it a one six three put out oh there you go we're really getting crazy here now in the eighth inning are we saying <laughs> <laughs> Alejandro Kovas left fielder freshman stands in Hudson Bonkel junior from Corona California out of Centennial High School second appearance on the season first pitch is low ball one to Kovas Bonkel's only other appearance this season came on February 18th against Lipscomb. One inning, three runs, one walk, and a strikeout. And he fires this one right on the top of the zone, strike one. One thing that impressed me about Bonkel and his background is, I mentioned the point of loyalty. He helped lead his high school to the playoffs for the first time in 11 seasons in baseball. Ground ball towards short, J.R. Nelson. A walk in the park for the freshman, makes the play. And that is out number two. But continuing on that point, a lot of players, you know, if you have a team that's not as competitive, a lot of times players will move out of that area or go to a different school to try to give themselves the best opportunity to go play at the next level. But stuck with this program, and they built something great to make the playoffs that's again awesome. for the first time in 11 seasons. It's great to see. Yeah, being able to go through adversity, you know, there's, a, there's an Ohio basketball player, A.J. Clayton. He had a, a really good high school career, but his team didn't win a lot. And learning through those losses, learning through those failures of struggling and, and how you still show up to work every day, that matters because at the end of the day, not every game and season is going to be perfect. And you have to be able to still bring that attitude and grow in some way. And let that be known to any baseball players growing up and listening in the area, you know, if your team isn't very successful, that doesn't mean that you as an individual player can't make it to a higher level. And it doesn't mean that your team, as you continue to build and grow, can't find success even when you're not having the best season in terms of wins and losses. Bonkle fires that one on the outside corner of the fastball with some flames behind it, three and two. Yeah, I like what Bonkle can bring. Uh, he's a guy that has had starting experience before. This is punched on the ground towards second. Alex Finney gobbles it up and chucks it to first in time. And how about that? A 1-2-3 inning for Hudson Bonkel. He is the sixth Ohio pitcher today. Ohio leads 21-16, heading to the bottom of the eighth inning from Athens.
Cole Williams approaching the lefty batter's box. Welcome back here inside our beautiful press box alongside Cedric Granger. I'm Sam Hyman, Cam Appel, and our outstanding crew as well here tonight. 21-16, ladies and gentlemen. It has been a roller coaster ride. So you've been on a lot of roller coasters. That's right. How would you describe this one? This one's pretty crazy. I know uh, the only ones I put ahead of it, Carowinds, Fury 325, unbelievable roller coaster. Veloci Coaster, which I've ridden down in Florida. That one's there for some Ohio representation, Millennium Force, Maverick, Steel Vengeance, and Orion. I think that one's hit as tall as Orion, 300 feet in the air. <laughs> Fly ball into left, and Alejandro Kovas will make the catch for out number one. So does this game, now, when you try to compare it to a roller coaster, are there a lot of loops, now flips, same. twists, turns, is it everything? Everything yep. you could imagine. I think so. I'd say a little bit of launches as well too because there's times where it slows down and then it's launched into high gear. We think about that third inning. We had a, a start where you know you got a lot of runs there, three to one through the first couple of innings. Then that third inning, it's like a nice 90 mile per hour launch that can melt your face off. It's that type of thing <laughs> right there. <laughs> Speaking of melt your face off, some of these pitchers, they got some speed on their pitches that can melt your face off. Hudson Bonkel was really dialing it up last half inning with his fastball as Franken fires that one on the outside corner. One ball and one strike to J.R. Nelson, the shortstop, who has made some nice plays at short today in addition to a couple of hits at the plate. 1-1, one, one, and this is popped up left side foul. One ball and two strikes, and... Ian Francis throws that one a little bit too high of his pitcher, Chase Franken. That'll trickle into shallow right field. 21-16 is our score. Ohio is looking to get back on track in the win column. Dropped two out of three last weekend against UIC. And this win would, if they hold on, as the one-two is looped in the air to shallow left center field. Derek Tarpley Jr. makes the catch, two down. If Ohio's able to hang on and win this game, would be a really good launch pad into yeah, MAC right. play against Northern Illinois, Illinois this weekend. Game. You know, hopefully they'll get some rest before that, but this has been a game where it's been all over the place. You're able to win this game, some good confidence going into it sure NIU. Is. Especially through the rainy conditions that you had. Your offense, you have so much to rave about in terms of how well they've hit against the Youngstown State pitchers. The only thing that's really troubling is the pitching staff being in the situation that it is. A lot of guys threw a lot of pitches and may not be available till maybe the Saturday or the Sunday game of that series. So it'll be up to Coach Moore and the rest of his pitching staff uh, to go over there and make sure that everybody can, you know, get the certain innings that they need, get the recovery that they need. And I know that for a fact the Bobcats, they're – Staff, they do a great job taking care of the players and helping to put them in a situation that, hey, you're ready to go. Especially yeah. when it's MAC play, that's when it gets real. We saw what it was like for the MAC opener. It felt like the energy was just a little bit different when that Bowling Green series came. Absolutely. It's going to be important. A.J. Roush standing in for the Bobcats. Redshirt Jr., we've talked a lot about A.J. this game. And rightfully so. Gideon Antle just got hit by a pitch, so he's at first. And Roush takes outside one ball and no strikes. We talked a little bit about his high school journey at Olentangy Liberty. It's it's pretty awesome. You know, he was a part of a state championship team his sophomore year, but he didn't play a lot and still learned. But when he did play, one of the moments where he did play in the state championship game to win it, he was a pinch runner, and he scored. And that's a moment you'll never forget. Makes it only fitting that his best statistical category was in run scored. He's always been pretty active and has that good wherewithal for base running. And it appears the only Tangy Liberty coaches, they saw that. Because, again, when you're going to these schools in Central Ohio, your New Albany's, your Olin Tangy Liberty's, uh, your Olin Tangy Orange's, Olin Tangy's, you're going to be on the depth chart, especially as a freshman or sophomore. You'll be very talented, but you might get more reps on JV. That is a fair ball. Matt Thompson, long throw to first, is in time. What a throw by Matt Thompson at third base. So that retires the side. We go to the top of the ninth inning. This is the last chance for Youngstown State, down 21-16. What do we have in store? The Bobcats trying to hang on. Youngstown State 
trying to find more magic. We'll be back from Bob Wren Stadium after this. Welcome back to Bob Wren Stadium, folks, where the score is, yes, 21 to 16 here in the ninth inning alongside Cedric Granger, my broadcast partner, our great production crew, and our field reporter, Cam Appel. I'm Sam Hyman. Glad you're with us here in Athens. Cedric, this has been unbelievable. What a game, 21 to 16. And here we are, top of the ninth inning, Ohio, with its opportunity to close the door Jack Geyser on the mound. Yeah, it only took three hours and 45 minutes to get here, right? As we have Jack Geyser, who started on Sunday up at the play or up at the mound, and I think it's going to be exciting to see him pitch. You know why? They have his fastball listed at 92.6 miles per hour. He can bring the speed, and we'll see if he can close off this game for the Bobcats. Jack Geyser, all the smoke. Who wants it? 1-0 is downstairs, two balls and no strikes. Yeah, not only that, Geyser also brings a curveball and a changeup to his game as well. So already got a nice three-pitch mix, and that's as a freshman. Six foot two, got some good size already too. So definitely a reason to be excited if you're Coach Moore, and there's a reason why they gave him a start yeah. uh, against UIC. He did struggle in that start, but it did give him a great opportunity to get out there and go against some very talented players on the flames. Teddy Ruffner at the plate for Youngstown State. 3-0 pitch is outside, ball four. That's a four pitch walk. So Youngstown State's dugout is alive and well right now. You gotta appreciate the energy there. It's been a long day, but this is a big spot here with the number nine hitter, Brett Stanley coming to the plate. And look at this, quick visit, Tim Brown just put his hands on Geyser's chest, just try and relax him, calm him down. Just one batter, reset, refocus for the freshman from Medina. Yeah, I like that he's doing this nice and early as well too. One thing that's dangerous uh, for the Bobcats in this situation is that after this batter with Brett Stanley, the lineup card turns over and you got guys like Trey Law, you got Derek Tarpley uh, and Ian Francis that have all been pretty productive today. Each of those players have at least two RBI on the evening. The top of the order has lived up to the billing for Youngstown State. So if you're Geyser, you really want to try to find a way to get that first out right here if you can against Stanley. That misses upstairs. One ball and no strikes. 21 runs on 12 hits, four errors for Ohio. 16 runs, 12 hits, two errors, Youngstown State. And that misses outside, 2-0. So 
Jack Geyser has to just take a second, refocus. He walked the first batter of the inning and now is behind in the count 2-0 to Brett Stanley who has walked, got hit by a pitch and singled. The 2-0. And that is right down Court Street. This is great seeing the energy on both sides. I know with YSU, you've got to have that mindset. We've come too far to give up right now. You know, this game has been too long, too many hours sacrificed to not put in everything you can in this ninth. 2-1 is down and in. Three balls and one strike. Ohio has walked a ton today. So has Youngstown State. And Jack Geyser is in danger of walking back-to-back -back batters to start this inning, and he does. So first and second with nobody out, and the lineup turns over to the top, Trey Law at the plate. So that is the 10th time Youngstown State, or pardon me, the ninth time Youngstown State has drawn a walk today. Trey Law. One hit in this game, and takes a strike on the outside corner. There are two hits today, pardon me, for Trey Law. A two-run single and a single back in the first. He also walked in the seventh. A shortstop from Camp Hill, Pennsylvania. 0-1 is bounced on the ground to second. Finney gobbles it up, chucks to second for one. Nelson, the return throw is just late. J.R. Nelson. Almost a 4-6-3 double play, but instead, Trey Law reaches on a fielder's choice, and Teddy Ruffner moves to third. Stanley is out 4-6. to six. Fortunately for the Bobcats, and fortunately for Geyser, just at least get that first one down, I think, is huge uh, for him in terms of a mental standpoint. Uh, you don't have to deal with the bases loaded situation, but the double play would have been nice especially with this guy up at the plate. Got to be careful. Derek Tarpley Jr. already with a three-run homer in this game. His first of many as a Penguin, just a freshman. Runners at the corners, one down. And Geyser delivers. 0-1 is buried. One and one. Right now you're seeing the future of mid-major Ohio baseball right in front of you. Geyser, 92.6 mile per hour fastball, just the start his college career. And then Tarpley, who's already been drafted. Stars are shining bright under the night sky. 1-1 one, one is pulled on the ground towards short. Nelson throws to Finney for one. The throw to first, late run scores. But there are two outs. Ohio has one more out to grab. And this game is over, but... Youngstown State is now within four, 21-17. Got that football score again, that popular <laughs> football score. Time and time again. Better yet, no runners in scoring position right now for YSU after that fielder's choice. Last chance, Ian Francis. Couple of RBIs today. A junior from Youngstown, Ohio. Jack Geyser unleashes. And the 1-0 is right down the pipe, strike one. Youngstown State down to its final out. The Penguins at one point led in this game 13-3, believe it or not. That's on the outside corner, strike two. The third inning featured a total of 20 runs. Youngstown State scored 10 in the top. Ohio, 10 in the bottom. But the Bobcats, so far, got the upper hand late. One, two, pulled on the ground towards third, and it's fair down the third baseline. Trickling towards the corner, Derek Tarpley Jr. turns on the Jets, and he scores. A triple with two outs in the ninth. Ian Francis keeps this game alive. And it's 21-18, Ohio still in front. Well, Sam, whenever you can hug the third base or first base lines, that is a recipe for extra bases, especially if you can get it past that infield. It was a decent diving attempt by Gill, but just too good of a hit by Ian Francis. How big was that? <laughs> and now a runner in scoring position with the heart of the order up for YSU. 
Wow, just never say die moment right there. Ian Francis with his third hit of the game. He has three RBIs, and here is R.J. Sherwood. Battled injury earlier this year, looking for his first hit today, and he takes his strike, nothing and one. One thing I want to mention, too, how fast all the runners were hustling. You know, there always is that thing where people say, oh, when penguins fly, I'll do this thing. Well, these penguins were flying <laughs> around the base pass. Sherwood grounds this one fair down the third baseline again. A run scores, and Sherwood has his first hit of the game. It's a double, and this game is not done yet. Two-run contest. Youngstown State has pushed three across in the top of the ninth. And, like and that was like, image. exactly. Yeah, identical, yeah. Exact same play, rope down the third baseline, and you know, I'll say the exact same thing, recipe for extra bases. R.J. Sherwood, who did not have a hit tonight. I mean, up and down the lineup for Youngstown State, feels like everybody's got a hit. He's actually one of just two players that has not gotten a hit prior to this inning. We've got a pinch runner, Eli Brown, will pinch run for R.J. Sherwood. So the batter now is Matt Thompson who has two bunt singles. Would be a little surprising to see a bunt here though with two outs, first pitch misses down. One ball and no strikes with a runner at second, two down, Ohio up by two in the ninth. 21-19. Geyser regroups and deals, and a fastball Hammers the outside corner, strike one. One ball and one strike with two down in the top of the ninth inning. Ohio clinging to a 21-19 lead. And a game that's lasted nearly four hours. This has popped up down the right field line. Here's A.J. Roush, and he snatches it to retire the side. Ball game, one for the books. The Bobcats prevail in a marathon slugfest. 21-19 your final score as Ohio improves to four and six overall. Youngstown State falls to 0 and 10. Jaw dropping numbers tonight, Cedric. Yeah, this is gonna be one of those all time scorecards where, you know, put it in a museum. Put it in a museum at this point. 21 to 19. 40 combined runs, and just credit to both of these teams. Of course, Ohio for overcoming the adversity. They were trailing 13-1 uh, to 1 at one point in this game, and they found a way to come back. But also Youngstown State for putting up one heck of an effort here on the road. They were 0-9 coming into this game. They came out with a vengeance, and they gave it everything they got. But the Bobcats, just a little bit too much tonight for Youngstown State. And, of course, you got to give credit where credit is due. Gideon Antle, 8 RBI evening for Gideon Antle. That was huge when the Bobcats needed every single one of those 21 runs. Yeah, major shout out to Gideon Antle. So Ohio prevails 21 to 19. Your final score from Bob Wren Stadium for our outstanding crew today behind the scenes doing all the work. We can't thank you enough. Cedric Granger, my broadcast partner, also field reporter Cam Appel. We say good night from Athens. The Bobcats win it 21 to 19. We'll talk to you next time. Thanks for watching.